All right, all right, all right, all right. It is Tuesday, my folks. You are on the Confluent YouTube channel, and it means that it's a uh, time for live streams. Welcome, 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 everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. That's great. We will have a great show for you today. And uh, in order to make it even more awesome, I brought a friend today. So, James, say hi to internet. Hey, Victor. Hi, internet. Great to be with you today. Looking forward to getting hands on with everybody. So it's going to be uh, super fun. Yeah, it's, it is. It is going to be super fun. So, James, like we have this uh, live streams show where the people um, uh, usually like follow along. I'm doing something stuff. And now we do we're going to be doing something together with you. And the people also should uh, get follow uh, follow along. But uh, before we That's start right. this. Get Get ready to get your hands dirty because we're uh, we're all diving in together into this. So it's going to be so it's we're, be we're fun. Um, so we do have this tradition. We do have this uh, uh, kind of people usually tell where they're coming from. So the people writing this in the YouTube chat, where they're coming from, and where are you coming from? I'm coming from uh, New Jersey today, as always, as my previous streams, and you're coming from. Colorado, right? Yeah, that's right. I'm in the mountains in Colorado where it's a perfect, sunny, beautiful day. My kids are out skiing this morning. And so that means hopefully they will not be interrupting us this morning. What about your kids, Victor? Are they they going to be uh, hanging out with us and writing some code with maybe, us Maybe, maybe. Michael definitely might be uh, hanging out with us uh, and during school. So we do have some uh, greetings from uh, Brazil. So um, let's see what's our geography today. Uh, from uh, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. Ooh, uh, how's the weather there? Um, we have a few folks from India, That's San great. Francisco, San Francisco. Welcome. Uh, now, Victor, you said that this is about um, Tuesday, like this happens on Tuesdays, but for some of our viewers, it might actually be Wednesday already, right? Already. Wow. Yeah, exactly. Thanks so much if you join us uh, during the night period in your, in your place. Good morning from uh, Mexico City. Uh, so let's see who else. This is like uh, all around the globe. This is so fun. Yeah, to some of so the, uh, on my uh, backyard from the Pennsylvania. Yay. You folks from my uh, from my uh, garden state, Quebec City, San Diego, Boston, Massachusetts. Wow, that's great. That's great. We're getting pretty good, uh, pretty good um, geography. Dallas, Toronto, Georgia, Tampa, Florida. Wow, that's oh, great. Pr Pratik, uh, Pratik is with us today. Hi, Pratik. And Pratik with us. Great. It's uh, it's very well known person in our community. Thanks so much for joining, Pratik. My buddy, Ricardo. Uh, thank you for support. Thanks for joining. Uh, Hans from Holland. Happy trails, Hans. Uh, I, man, I, I, I wish to say this to some Hans. Uh, that's, thanks for uh, making my dream come true, Hans. All right, Germany, Austin, Texas, Salt Lake City. Again, New Jersey. Yeah, we do. We do dominate. So, yeah, great. All right, awesome. So, folks, uh, today uh, we're going to be uh, talking about some exciting stuff. So, you can continue to have uh, this conversation in the chat, uh, make some noise. Um, but uh, we have uh, exciting uh, materials for you today. So, without further ado, I will go with the James screen, and we will show you a few slides so you would know where we're standing. <laughs> Yeah, great. So you're here today for a session where we're going to do some serverless Kotlin and Kafka on Google Cloud and Confluent Cloud, and we're going to get hands on. So uh, so this is going to be something we're all going to work through together. Uh, a little bit about me. I am a developer advocate for Google Cloud, and um, I uh, live up in the mountains, so I get to ski with my kids. It's a picture of me pulling one of my kids in what's called a chariot, because uh, they're small kids. Luckily, they're not big. I probably wouldn't be able to pull them if they were big. Um, and uh, so, yes, yeah, so I live in the, the mountains. Bigger kids, and, uh, in, in pulling like a bigger kids in the chariots, it's more in my uh, uh, my uh, ballpark, you know. The, yeah, Victor, you, because you're strong. You, you, you can pull bigger kids. But, <laughs> but me, I, I can only do the small kids. 
Um, so I've been a Java developer for a long time, been doing uh, Scala and, and Kotlin most recently. And, uh, and so today we're going to be doing Kotlin and Spring Boot. And uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun. And Victor, what, what, where can we find you? Everybody, I'm sure, knows you. Um, you're um, amazing, if you first time but... on this channel, I know that some of you are here uh, who came in on the previous uh, previous episodes uh, and thank you for your support. And if, if you're first time on this channel, I'm doing these live streams every week on Tuesdays. Um, and this is my jam, this is my jazz. Uh, but also you can find me on Twitter. Um, you can also find me in the Telegram or you know watch some of my video on YouTube. And I also a developer advocate, uh, but I work with Confluent and... Uh, Try to help uh, people with all questions with Kafka. So that's me. Is that a real Kafka tattoo, or is that like just one of those temporary ones that you like? I do can't with water? confirm nor deny. So there should be some of the mystery between uh, us and audience. So I cannot. Uh, it it may be. I'm, uh, I'm still trying to get will... rid of my flex tattoo that I have from like 15 years ago. Right. And it's, right. You know, no, I'm, I'm seeing I'm like if this someday video it wears will... off. If this video will take, say, I don't know, 10,000 likes. Uh, so in this case, I will make it permanent. So let's do it. <laughs> awesome. Wow. Offering a tattoo your body for likes. That's uh, a, a new level of developer advocacy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we can. Okay, so here's our agenda for today. We're going to start with a little bit of introduction about some of the technologies we're going to be using today. And then we're going to dive right into hands-on. We're going to do some setup on Google Cloud and on Confluent Cloud. And then we're going to produce some messages. We're going to transform some messages. And we're going to consume some messages and, uh, and be going through a lot of code as we go along. So first, let's talk a little bit about serverless. Uh, serverless is kind of a new buzzword, um, but what does it really mean? Uh, you know, sometimes it's hard to, to separate the, the buzzwords uh, from, from what the actual value is. So from my perspective, perspective serverless is all about having demand-driven infrastructure. So it is infrastructure that scales up and down dynamically based on the actual demand, and if you're in the cloud, you only pay for what you're actually using. So in typical architectures and infrastructure, we typically over provision. And so that means that there is unutilized resources that we are paying for. And in the serverless model, we because we have this demand driven infrastructure, we're able to only pay for what we use if we're in the cloud. But Serverless is really a, an operational model for cloud, uh, cloud native applications or 12 factor applications. And so there's some things that we'll walk through today where you'll see how that actually exposes. The ability to have that dynamic scaling really depends on your application being architected to be able to do that through cloud native or 12 factor. Now, if you're on premises or in your own data, if you're in your own data center or uh, maybe running, managing your own uh, Kubernetes cluster or other way to manage your cluster of uh, machines, then serverless is still actually important to you. And the, the place where I first heard a term for this was with Netflix. So Netflix has a bunch of servers that they have provisioned and, uh, and they keep these servers around, uh, you know, some number of the servers around, uh, but when they're not actually being used by like request-based workloads, so an HTTP request coming in or some data transformation happening, then they actually take some of those resources and return them to what's called the trough. And the trough in their infrastructure is a place where workloads that are not based on like user activity or, or data processing that needs to happen right now, it's, it's workloads that can happen really at any time and don't need dedicated resources. They can pull those resources out of the trough and use those. So serverless is also important when you're in that kind of infrastructure so that you have that trough that you can do machine learning training from, uh, things that are not as time sensitive. And so the serverless architecture, it's certainly useful whether you're in a managed cloud service or whether you're managing your own infrastructure. So there's, uh, this looks a little bit different depending on what the actual kind of way of operation is. What does demand mean in the application? If you're talking about HTTP services, Demand is when a request is made to a service. And so in the case of the service that we're going to be using today, which is on Google Cloud called Cloud Run, 
you only pay for when there are requests coming in. So if there are no requests coming into an instance, then you're not paying for that instance. So that's the way that the pay for what you use uh, works. And of course, then your number of instances changes based on your demand. And in the case of uh, Confluent Cloud and Kafka, they have different ways to measure what pay for what you use means. And so they have uh, cost per gigabyte for ingress, egress, storage, and then you also pay for your partitions as they're being used. Yeah. What else and, to add uh, on that? The thing, is, the thing is, like, uh, the pain for the clusters and number of nodes is, like, so, you know, 2005, I don't know. Yeah, so in this case, like, actually pay for only what you use. In this case, if you, uh, in case of Kafka, Kafka provides a storage, which is more important, and uh, you pay for storage. And since Confluent Cloud offers unlimited retention, you just basically pay, you know, for as long as you want to store this data, right? That's right. So it's, it's based on what you're using and the demand. So in the case of Kafka, if you're actually sending and receiving messages, then, then that is the demand and that's, that's what you pay for. And in the case of an HTTP service, it's the request. Exactly. Okay. So now let's uh, take this a little bit further. So if serverless is great. We have different ways to do serverless. And one of the things that we wanted to focus on in this workshop is something that I call portable serverless, uh, because there are, are certain... us, like, and people were asking us in uh, when we were preparing, like, why, why it's why portable? Like, mm -hmm. why, what do you mean? Like, uh, like, why it's important, right? Yeah. So there are serverless models where you just have a managed service, and and you can only really run your thing in that managed service. Uh, I. Uh, I've you know been doing infrastructure stuff for a long time, and uh, one of the things that I really feel is important is to be able to be portable across, be able to take my thing that I'm working on and run it on my machine, run it on my CI system, use it as a managed serverless cloud, uh, or use it on my own infrastructure however I want to. Maybe that's Kubernetes or something like that. Is it a uh, response to like a very famous like vendor lock-in type, uh, type of conversation when we probably, every one of us, like have a, at least once or twice in our life? That's, yeah, I, I have been burned by that in the past. So Victor, you may remember um, back back a long time ago, one of the ways that we would do things is that it was too painful to like start your database on your machine and do your local development and local integration tests and all that on yep. uh, with an actual database running. So we would use H2, which is an in-memory database, nice and fast. And then we ran into all sorts of issues because the database that we were using on our local development machine was not the same database that we would use in production. So much pain and so much work went in to try to deal with this problem. Well, it turns out that there's a much better way. What we can do now is we just run that database on our machine. And there's something called test containers, which we've used for this project, which makes it really easy to take those services that we depend on and, you, and run them on our local development machine and use those same test containers. These are based on Docker containers. Docker containers are a unit of portability. And so we can then take those same test containers and run them in our CI environment. And then because we're, we can then take that same thing and run it on our Kubernetes infrastructure if we want, or we can use a managed serverless cloud uh, to also run our containers uh, or be the place that our applications run or our data is hosted. And so being able to have that portability across all those different environments with consistency is hugely important and really reduces a lot of problems that crop up as we're moving from development to testing to production. And especially the the infrastructure management solutions like Kubernetes uh, help to alleviate this uh, portability problem or like a portability uh, issue. So essentially, technically, it's a baseline. You know, you, if you can run this on the local Kubernetes cluster or in one provider, you will be able to run this uh, probably without any changes in another like a provider. So. Yeah. yeah, so we're going to be touching some of the things here. So we we're going to be touching some of the test containers for local development. Um, it would be part of the things that uh, you will be able to touch. Uh, you, we will touch the cloud run, which is essentially um, a pass on top of Kubernetes that allows you to run the serverless workloads without 
thinking about your infrastructure and do, like writing tons on YAML. Like uh, write down in the comments if you love writing uh, YAML uh, in uh, <laughs> in this in this case. Is, um, is Bruno and, with us uh, today? Uh, hopefully, if they will, we will show him. Uh, we will show him a recording. So, <laughs> and uh, we will touch on uh, some of the things around how it will be implemented in um, like a serverless function style. And I just tweeted this this morning that um, one of the uh, uh, how you can offend the programmer with one tweet. I tweeted that uh, SQL is not real language. Yes, it is, and we will show that uh, SQL allows you to write your serverless functions. We're going to be using Key SQL as example of stateful uh, function. And uh, this is a uh, uh, James will um, bring uh, this slide that explains what we're going to be doing today. Yeah, so here's what we're going to be building. We are going to be taking a stream of data, and uh, we because this is just a workshop, we don't have access to like a like a good real stream of data. So we're going to take a simulated stream of data, which is just a list of Stack Overflow questions. So imagine you're working at Stack Overflow. You probably have a stream of the questions that are being asked on Stack Overflow and changes that are happening. Uh, so that's the data stream that we're going to be using, and you can go check it out. Uh, this is this is the uh, powered by a WebSocket that is just feeding historical Stack Overflow questions to us. Okay, so that's the data that we're starting with is this Stack Overflow question stream, and we're going to take that question stream and we're going to do some transformation on that stream. The first transformation that we're going to do is we're going to keep just a running tally of the total number of favorites across all questions. So as the stream's coming in, we're just keeping the sum of all the favorites. And then we're going to do another transform where there's tags on each Stack Overflow question. And we're just going to count how many questions per tag. And we're going to keep that state. And then the final step is we're going to have a web application that then renders that total number of favorites and the counts, the number of questions per tag, and just shows us that data. Sometimes, sometimes people ask me, like, if it's uh, KeySQL DB is a real cloud streaming database, like how we can use this in the microservice. And the, the third step, like the stream viewer, this actually shows you how you can use um, KeySQL DB as a cloud streaming database and use this as a part of Spring Boot application. So I think it's, uh, it's pretty exciting. Yep. OK, so I say we dive in and, uh, and get going. Yes, uh, and this is, uh, folks, this is the moment where you can, uh, you know, roll your sleeves. My sleeves are already rolled, and I am ready to uh, to start rolling. So you can use the short link, is uh, bit.ly slash serverless-kk. So in this case, you will get to the page uh, that James will show in um, in his screen in a second. So you yeah, should be yeah, able to see... Serverless-kk. Okay, and you so here is our workshop instructions. Documents. Let's make it big so everyone can see it. Okay, it looks like we got a bunch of people in the document, so people are coming in. That's great, and this has the the all the instructions for everything we're going to be walking through today. But of course, Victor and I are going to lead you through the steps so you can follow along. So we'll give uh, people um, a minute here to get into the doc, and and then we'll get started. So the first lab that we're going to do is just going to be some setup. And this is really the hardest thing of, of the whole day is as, getting as everything always. set up. Always the, the hardest thing. You know, we yeah. as developer advocates, we, we really try to make the, the setup as easy as possible. And so we've done a few things today to, to try to make things smooth um, and, and hopefully uh, things go well. But if they don't, if you're having any issues, uh, just post in the, the chat and we'll try to help you out. Or maybe some folks that are also in the chat can, can help you out. Pe can people see everyone's chats, right? Yes, all, uh, everyone yeah. is in the chat. As long as you are um, kind and uh, polite to each other, um, you will see each other messages here. So, um, but do not post anything about YAML. Um, <laughs> we do have a robot that might potentially ban you. So, There's the uh, YAML robot. Uh, <laughs> YAML banning robot. Yeah, yeah. So great. Okay, so let's let's uh, let's dive in. Um, so here is something really, really, really important. You need to today use a Gmail account. We're going to be using Google Cloud, so we're going to be using a Google account, and you need to use a personal account. 
do not use your corporate account. This can get a little bit tricky because maybe you're logged into your browser as your corporate Google account. You're using uh, Google Drive and, and Gmail for work and all that kind of stuff. Do not use that account. Uh, if you are logged into your browser with that account, I recommend you open a guest or incognito window, something like that, so that you make sure that you are using a personal account. The reason for this is that sometimes uh, organizations put constraints around what their employees can do with their Google, corporate Google accounts. And today, we don't want any of those things to get in our way. So you need to make sure that you use a personal Gmail uh, account. OK, if you don't have one, you can go create one. And I'm going to go create one from scratch because uh, I want you all to see, uh, see what this process is like. So I'm going to go create my new Google account. And the email address that I'm going to use here is skk at jamesward.com. And let's create a password. So um, got to put in a nice long one. Um, and hopefully I remember it. And hopefully I typed that all right. OK, great. So I um, am now uh, being asked to verify. And let's see if I go over to my other computer over here, then I should be we able can, to get the code. We can code. switch the screen and uh, see some questions while the James is verifying. Um, and uh, yeah, that's uh, uh, let's see if we have uh, some some good questions in the chat for a while. Yes, so link to this document, uh, it will appear in the chat very soon. And thank you so much to uh, my friend and colleague, uh, Victoria. She's uh, just posted this link. You can find this in a bit.ly, short link, slash serverless-kk. So go in there. And I right now see over 100 people already jumped into this document. For those of you who are asking about, uh, there was a question, if uh, you can do the thing, um, if you can do the thing afterwards, yes, you can. And this is the place where we put all the links, all the links that you will be using today, including some of the coupon codes and the things that you can use in your um, in, in, in your thing. You can find this in this uh, document. Once again, bit.ly slash serverless-kk. OK, I am verified and ready to continue. Oh, we uh, we might have a very popular document, James, very soon, and we'll have a high uh, traffic alert uh, also a very uh, very very soon. Well, that's great. Um, Let's make sure. Again, if you um, if you registered um, through the email, uh, I will post. We will will send you email. If you registered through YouTube, I will post this in in Twitter. And do not forget, uh, go follow me and James in Twitter and appraise us in there. And also, like, we will definitely find the, uh, post the slides afterwards. All right, back to you, James. OK. OK, so I have verified that my email is mine. And now I'm going to put in uh, a birthday and my gender. And I'm not sure why they asked for this information, but they have a link why we ask for this information. <laughs> OK, and I agree to whatever is being stated there. Uh, you should probably read anything you agree to. Um, <laughs> OK, so now I am logged in with my uh, skk at jamesward.com account. And usually when I do this, I need to actually refresh this document. It's going to say, hey, um, you, uh, you um, need to uh, refresh this page. OK, and oh, let's see now. Now, let's now see, you went was, into, uh, uh, into the into high view, mode. viewer mode, into high traffic mode. OK, let me see if I can fix that real quick. I can uh, I can show this on my screen uh, for now a uh, little quick. Okay. So you will be able to uh, to fix that. So the next thing that once you already in your um, in this um, in this document, you will be able to do next. So you already have this um, um, your account. So you can try and see if you go to Google Cloud Console and make sure again, if you're using multiple accounts, uh, uh, I do believe right now it will default to my corporate account on the top. I will switch to something like my personal account. So I don't need to use my corporate here. 
and um, now you would see this one it says different project which is totally fine we'll switch to some uh, some project called live streams in this particular case now uh, we good uh, good to go so the next okay. thing is that um, James you ready 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 so it didn't James. it didn't send me back to the uh, to the regular view but that's okay we can continue uh, can you do a uh, bigger still kind of like a oh let's zoom? see yes here we let's go here we go that. there we go still works okay great Okay, so I'm signed into my Google account, and then I need to sign into the Google Cloud Console. So let's that's console.google.com or console.cloud.google.com. Yeah, we're already, uh, I already is, passed course, that with them. Awesome. Okay, you and then I, I'm going to agree to these terms of service. I am in the United States, so certainly review anything that you agree to. Okay, so now I'm in the Cloud Console. Great. Now, um, normally when you use most cloud products, you need to enter a credit card, uh, even though there's a way to get started for free and there's free tiers that you can use. Uh, but we have a special way for you today so that you can, uh, you can move forward without having to enter a credit card. And we do this by applying uh, just a little bit of credits to your account. Um, and is that link wrong? Okay, interesting. Um, so this is supposed to be, oh, I should not, <laughs> that's confusing. Okay, get a coupon code and apply it. I also, for some reason, made this a link, uh, gcpcredits.com, um, which is where we need to go, but we need to go to gcpcredits.com slash SKK, um, not, not just the main page there. Okay, so this is a, a page that's going to give you a special coupon code that we're gonna use today. So gcpcredits.com slash SKK. So now I need to sign into this page with my Google account. So let's sign in there. And there we go. Okay, so what you should see is a screen that looks like this. It's now saying that we are doing the Confluent Workshop and the event is SKK. And now that I'm signed in, I can click to access my credits and it is uh, allocated me a coupon code and then i can apply this coupon to my account and this will set up something that's called a billing account so on google cloud there is this uh, billing account that is how you pay for for using this service and so with that coupon code we now have a billing account set up that has uh, i think it, we just have five dollars of credits because we're actually not going to be using that um, anywhere near five dollars today um, but uh, you can of course do the try for three to get free to get more credits but we needed to have that billing account set up and so that's that's why we just did that GCP credits thing to get that coupon code. And um, don't okay. uh, do not worry; like these uh, credits will be enough. Uh, if you uh, if yeah. if you think this will be not enough for you, uh, stick around for a few more, few more minutes. I do have a special uh, spe something special for you. So. <laughs> Awesome. Okay. And if you go in this top left menu to billing, then we can confirm, yes, I have a billing account and I've got my $5 promotional credits and, uh, and there we go. We're good to go. Okay. So that all hopefully worked for you. Um, if step four, we go to this, uh, project dashboard. This is just going to help us validate that we have everything set up in Google Cloud, that we're logged in, that we have created our billing account and applied the coupon code and and all that looks good. So um, Victor, any any problems that people are running into or anything there? Let's uh, let's see. Uh, so the, the people still struggling with these uh, high traffic things. Um, uh, but uh, so far, uh, so far, so good. I don't see any like uh, specific questions. So uh, credit is about five dollars, uh, right? So yes, this is credit for uh, Google Cloud platform. Um, next thing, we will set up um, uh, Confluent Cloud that will um, will take care of the buildings through the Confluent or through the Google Cloud. So um, that's uh, that's what you do. How to get the credits? Um, how to get the credits in this document that the James shared? There is a link to this. Um, this is task one, this step three. Task and one, you can step click three. this. 
get you a can coupon code. You can always get coupon and code. It. And this is how you can get your coupon code. I hope, uh, I hope this would be you know, self-explanatory once you create an account and log in. All right, so Alexander just said that uh, he successfully got his credits. That's great. So at least uh, one person successfully um, <laughs> get access to it. So it looks like our um, our instructions not that bad at all. So at least one person was able to figure this out. <laughs> Good. Yep. All right. So we will um, we will take a break in a minute and and uh, help everyone make sure they can they can get logged in and get the credits and get uh, everything set up in Google Cloud. But let's do this task two here, where we need to click this open Cloud Shell button, and we're going to be using something called Cloud Shell today to be doing uh, all of our work in Google Cloud and with uh, CLI stuff, command line stuff with Confluent Cloud as well. So when I click that link, what it's doing is it's taking me to Cloud Shell. I need to hit continue. And what Cloud Shell is, is it's like a server in the cloud on, on Google Cloud that gives us like a web-based SSH session into this, this, um, this instance, this server, server. And so this is for your account. And so, you know, if I you know, do an LS or something like that, I can see that. James, can you, uh, can you there. do a font a little bit bigger uh, for our people yes. to see? Yeah, so let's go increase this font size to the largest. There we go. There we How's go. that looking? Is that is that looking yeah, better? It looks great in in great. on my. Uh, I'm just checking on the TV just in case uh, if someone will watch this TV. By the way, uh, folks, you are watching this in uh, glorious 4K. So the TV 4K TV is only way only correct way to watch live streams with me and James Ward today. So please <laughs> do by all means. Uh, Full HD TV also works fine, um, but uh, you will enjoy more in 4K. All right, back to you, James. Okay, so we're in Cloud Shell and it's working for me. That's great. Uh, and so we're going to be doing a lot of stuff in Cloud Shell today. So this is really where we want to try to get to with everyone is to be able to get into Cloud Shell, have your your project set up in Google Cloud, and uh, and all that. So, so th think about this. It's yeah. we're doing like a serverless workshop. And literally, to perform this workshop, you don't need to have even, uh, um, you know, nothing installed on your computer. Um, so in this case, you can do the shell in the browser. But uh, while other people catching up with us, I want to show a little quick on my screen. Because uh, Google um, provides you the ways how you can do this cloud shell in your account. And if you have a, in your computer, just in case. So if you have a Google Cloud, uh, G Cloud tools installed in your computer, you can run this, uh, the Cloud Shell SSH, and uh, you will get to the similar experience that to get through the browser. So if you prefer to run this into, um, into your laptop, um, you will be able to do this. All right, so back to you, James. Awesome. Yeah, so it looks like there was um, some questions about some of the billing account stuff on Google Cloud. And so when we applied that credit uh, to our account, it created a billing account that does not require a credit card. There is a $300 credit that you can also apply to your account, but in that one, you need to have a credit card uh, applied as a billing instrument uh, for you to get that $300 credit. So that's why we just did the $5 credit that does not require a credit card is because um, that makes things a bit smoother. But after this workshop, if you want to go claim that $300 credit uh, and you know play around more, you can. But we're, uh, we're because we're serverless, we're uh, actually going to use very little resources today and probably going to be well under the free tier of Cloud Run and Google Cloud uh, that we're using. Um, and so... So yeah, we should be fine with just that $5 credit. So another okay. point here is that um, once you set up this through this way, um, you don't need to do anything on the Confluent Cloud side of things because in this case, uh, we will sign up to Confluent Cloud through uh, Google Cloud. And uh, this is the very nice way to, to manage things. Um, if you run your workloads in, um, in the Google Cloud and, uh, and uh, want to use some of the Kafka bits, <clears throat> you just go to marketplace and enable um, Confluent Cloud uh, through through the marketplace, and that would be you know much much more easier and uh, much more straightforward. Yep, and that's exactly what we're going to do next. Is we wanted to have. Um, 
consolidated billing essentially for Google Cloud and Confluent Cloud. And there's a way to do that, um, but we have to have a billing account set up on Google Cloud so that we can do it that way. We didn't want to have uh, make you have to enter a credit card on Google Cloud and then a credit card on Confluent Cloud. Um, so we've tried to make that super easy uh, for you with these credits. So um, We have a question, James. Uh, there's uh, Jerry who missed how to launch Cloud Shell. Um, and oh, okay. uh, can you also so everything's in the workshop. The... So exactly. task, task two, uh, step one, there's a link here, open Cloud Shell. And the link that it's taking you to is shell.cloud.google.com. And then, um, then it's telling it to only show the terminal. And there is a web-based IDE as well in Cloud Shell that we'll show off in a little bit. But, um, um, but for now, we just want to be in the terminal. So right. that was task right, cool. two, step one there. So and uh, is it uh, is it time for uh, for you, James, to enable some uh, some Kafka stuff? Yeah, let's go on to task three here. So we're still in lab one, task three, and what we're going to do is we're going to go set up Confluent Cloud. So there's a link here, lots of links in this document to to help you. But we're going to click this open Apache Kafka on Confluent Confluent Cloud in the Google Cloud Marketplace. That's a lot of words. That's, um, yeah, awful. <laughs> So this just takes us to a place in the Google Cloud Console where we can go and provision our Confluent Cloud stuff. So I'm in Marketplace. Uh, you'll see that I have my project selected. This is really important if you have multiple projects. So maybe you've done something on Google Cloud before and you have multiple projects here. Make sure that you are using the project that was just created when we applied those credits. Um, so make sure you're using that one. If you're not sure, if you have multiple projects and you're not sure which one to use, um, I think if you go into uh, billing, then you'll be able to get more information on which one is using the, the right um, billing account today, the one that was just created. Okay, so I've got my my first project selected. I wonder if it's always called my first project. Maybe that's an easy way to know which one to use. Is yeah, I think yeah. maybe it's maybe, always called. Uh, maybe it's a kind of like a sane defaults, right? That's right. Yep. What if that's not my first project, though? What if it's hmm. you know it could be my second project? In case you know, in that case, it would be incorrect to say my first project. Yeah, like uh, my previous boss <laughs> used to say, you know, assumptions are very dangerous. Uh, you know, but so right. maybe it's uh, something something else. Yep. Right. Okay. So I'm going to click purchase on this thing within the Google Cloud Marketplace. And now this is asking me some information about you know what I want my subscription to be and plan and all that kind of stuff. I'm just going to use the default. Now you'll see this billing account. This is the Google Cloud Platform trial billing account. That's the one that was created with that five dollar credit without a credit card. And then there's some terms that I can review and agree to. And then I'm going to hit subscribe. So now this is just creating a linkage between my Google Cloud uh, project in my Google Cloud billing and Confluent Cloud. OK, the order request has been sent. And now I'm going to click this Go to Marketplace button. And now I'm back on that same page that I was on before. But now instead of saying Purchase, it says has a button here that says Enable. So now that I have purchased the Confluent Cloud service, now I can enable it. <clears throat> OK, so that's enabling the API. That'll take just a minute to do that. And then we will do a few more setup steps on Confluent Cloud. OK, there we go. We are now enabled. And it's giving us some information about that. Now, there's this button up here at the top that says Manage via Confluent. Uh, if you have gotten lost, then you can either go back to the document and click that link that we started with, the open uh, here in, in the marketplace, or you can use the hamburger menu. That's called the hamburger menu because it looks like a hamburger. Um, I or was maybe it's super a surprised when I learned about sure. this. It's maybe pancakes. For me, it looks more uh, like a pancakes menu. <laughs> Uh, so you can Maybe click that, that hungry. and go to Marketplace. <laughs> yeah, maybe we are getting, it's, it is like past your lunchtime, Victor. So. Yeah, yeah, that's all right, yeah. So when you go to Marketplace, you will see that right on this featured front page is our Confluent Cloud service. And we can go in this way as well and see, hey, there is the one that I have purchased and enabled. And then if I go back to where I was, which is on, uh, if I click Manage, 
then there's this manage via Confluent button. And that's where we're going next. So now Google says, hey, um, you know, be be careful. Uh, <laughs> be careful over there on the Confluent stuff, you know. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. So Yeah, um, it's uh, always uh, say, better safe than sorry. That's right. <laughs> Okay, so now I, I I am over on Confluent Cloud, and now I need to sign up for Confluent Cloud so that I get an account over there. Uh, I don't think it really matters what email. I don't think it needs to be the exact same email that you used uh, before. Um, but just to be safe, I'm going to use my same email that I use. So that's SKK it is. It is. Uh, it, it will work with other emails, but it's very good to have a stay consistent with um, you know the things that you use. Um, otherwise, it would be difficult to track things down. So personally, I like to have this like uh, aliases or how you call those, the small things that you can add to your email, like a plus or something like that. <laughs> oh, okay. Oh, like no. Them. Oh, no. <laughs> what is happening? Contact support. Uh, <laughs> Victor, are you my support? Uh, try to uh, try to refer, try, try to try one more time. Have you tried to turn on, turn off? That's right. Turn turn it off and turn it back on again. I'm wondering if it's uh, maybe uh, like a browser issue um, uh, or something like that. Just um, let's see. That's embarrassing. <laughs> <laughs> that's uh, that's what happens. Um, at least it's at me, least it's honest. Yeah. Let me try on my side of things. Maybe okay. um, uh, maybe it is something that you know. One of those days. You're doing some of the live presentation, and now this is how you know that th this is not a pre-recorded or pre-baked. Um, That's right. In uh, in this case, so give me this one is, second. This is real. Yeah, it's real as it gets. <laughs> um, give me just a quick second. I will open my uh, my account uh, as well, um, and I'm going to this uh, live streams project. and Apache Kafka for Confluence. So I will show my screen real quick. So manage on provider, I click here, so click OK. Uh, uh, and Victor, I just tried again and it worked, so. Yep, you know, okay, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's how it uh, usually turn, goes. Turn it um, off, turn it back on again and. Yeah, exactly. But uh, um, I just got uh, re-logged in. I'm back to you, James. So you will okay, get so uh, I. Yep. So, so Confluent Cloud has said uh, we need to validate my email, and it has sent me an email to do that. And so, uh, over on my other computer, I'm going to go and uh, validate that. And then I while should be you're able doing to this, log I can. In. We can have uh, this like a perfect handoff, and this is where what you will see uh, once you validate. So you should be able to um, to log in and you will see something like an empty screen where you can do some, some, some other stuff. While James is validating, let's check if we do have in uh, any other questions. Um, so demo goats not happy. No, I mean, demo goats are super happy about us. Um, <laughs> and uh, it, it happens. So like you, know, like you said, solar flares so, usually. It always happens or... when the stuff goes from the computer to the space to the cloud and things like that. So, um, so we do have a, a partner who just reports that it works. And um, yes, Great. we need to contact emotional support. We all need this. Thank you so much for bringing this up. I will talk to management. Yeah. Um, if. Uh, um, so in this case, it's not going to be SSO. The SSO uh, in this case will not work. So you need to kind of like a sign up and enable um, enable this. Um, in terms of SSO, Confluent I need Cloud to check. probably does have corporate yeah. SSO, right? Like the, some the, of the some do. of the corporate uh, integrations, uh, you will be able to enable. So this is how like works, for example, for us. Uh, we do have SSO through Okta, and uh, um, it actually integrates fairly well with uh, Google Cloud and Confluent Cloud. So. Um, ask your corporate SSO provider how to. Um... So if it says purchase, try this uh, until uh, you will be able to purchase it. 
Um, I hope, I really wish, I, I was watching the presentation that James did at uh, Devrel Con and uh, he was talking about the, some of the uh, project managers um, uh, would love to see this feedback. It, it's great, uh, hopefully we'll have some project managers in, uh, in this live chat and they'll uh, see some of the feedback um, and find the ways how we can improve this in the future. All right, so uh, I love when the people reported that it's worth for, 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 for them. Uh, Janos just um, reported that it worked from the third time. I can't okay. believe that we're creating so much demand <laughs> that we are um, uh, creating troubles in uh, Google Cloud and um, in the Confluent Cloud. Right? This is like the first time we've like done like something at this scale before, right? Like, yeah, that's I mean, uh, no, that's great. Uh, so, what's the? Uh, I need to check the numbers. How many people uh, right now are watching? So, so it's uh, roughly uh, 386 people are watching, which is uh, it's pretty cool. Um, and uh, I don't know how many people will watch in reply. All right. So, get back to um, we're getting back to uh, to the screens and uh, James. So what we see right now is that uh, he is ready to do streaming. I'm ready to log in. Yep. So. Um, I have I have verified my account and now I can go and log into my Confluent Cloud account. So let me do that. Yeah. Fingers crossed. Yay. Okay. Right, so I am once I am in uh, Confluent Cloud. Fantastic, fantastic work, James. So as you as you know, as you saw, like when we just uh, sign up this, you will get uh, 200 bucks on uh, like a Confluent uh, account so you can start using your things. Um, but like stick around, I might have uh, some surprise for you. All right. So I think um, this is where I can take over and talk a little bit about yeah. uh, the Confluent Cloud, um, if you don't mind, Jay. Yep, I'm just going to skip so, this so that I get to the same place as you. But um, right. and I'm going to say, no thanks. I don't need the documentation right now because <laughs> Victor is my documentation. Exactly. So here, yeah, here's yeah. what so, hopefully everyone is seeing within Confluent Cloud, and then uh, Victor can. Yeah, so as, as, as you see, I, I synchronized our screens and we do he say, uh, see the same thing. So a couple things. You can do, like if you're the first time, you, you, you're doing this by yourself, you're watching this uh, live stream, you put this on pause and you decide to do this, you can actually go through the tutorial that walk you through the process and uh, select the correct um, uh, things for you. But I will be your uh, tutorial today. So uh, let, me, uh, let me close it. So I will go ahead and just create a cluster. We're going to be using basic cluster, just the cheapest possible, simplest possible. Uh, and I will start a configuration. So uh, we will use uh, US Central um, because we tested and it worked. And uh, really, it was closest to, to us or like a distance wise, it's uh, on the same um, uh, same distance from me and from James, essentially. Um, <laughs> That's right. It's you halfway can between us. And, exactly. uh, and we're also going to be deploying our web application in US Central 1. So that'll create the lowest latency between our, our uh, Kafka cluster and our web application running on Cloud Run. So that's why we use so, US Central. So interesting, uh, interesting thing uh, for those folks who are interested in uh, more resilient deployment. So we do support um, deployment across multiple regions, but in this case, you need to select a uh, standard um, cluster. But you see, it's a production ready. Maybe you don't need this for developing use cases. Maybe you start using this for testing or, or, or whatnot. So we're going into... Um, US uh, central single zone, just simple, and uh, click continue. I will be super um, um, original and will keep this as is. Um, you also can observe uh, all these uh, limits and uptimes and the costs uh, over here. It's we're pretty open about this, so that's uh, that's you can learn. And uh, Google Cloud provider, um, data encryption automatic and networking internet. Welcome to internet. I will show you um, how the things, <laughs> I will show you a few things around here. And now you have Kafka cluster in your, um, in your possession, uh, in a, literally in the seconds, right? So you can start using this. And this is where I'm passing to, um, to James, where he will show us some of the, uh, we're doing this, uh, Oh no, I, it's, it's still me. I still can do that. Yeah. So yeah. 
in my um, cloud shell, um, as I already stated, I will be using my uh, console because just like, I don't know, something for you to choose from. Like James will be using cloud shell, I will be using my console. So uh, in order to uh, operate this in my cloud shell, I need to, file already exists, that's good. And next thing is that I need to grab and install Confluence CLI. So Confluence CLI, it is going to be a tool that um, we will be using to uh, talk to our Kafka cluster and uh, using this to get some of the information for, um, say, how to connect to this uh, cluster. Next thing that in order to, uh, this command will be available everywhere, I will add this into path. And the next thing is that we need to um, actually log in to this uh, Confluent Cloud. Um, some of the folks who are following this channel for a while, they know uh, all this drill. Um, and uh, when I do this, um, it will be using my uh, Victor GCP live stream. If you haven't uh, done any login before, um, it will ask you to enter your uh, email uh, and password that you uh, will be using. And uh, in order to start doing things, we tried really hard to find the like, shortest uh, possible uh, number of commands that you need to do. But essentially what this command is doing, it's actually uh, using CCloud CLI uh, to get information about the clusters, uh, represent the output of this command in, um, um, in a JSON format. Uh, let me do this one. And uh, after that, we're using this small tool called JQ. I was surprised, James, that uh, JQ was available in uh, Google Cloud Shell out of the box. So, so much uh, attention to details for developers. It's, it's really great. Um, <laughs> so we don't need to, to install this. It's, it's fantastic. So, and now I need to use this particular cluster. In, so what uh, is that cluster my... ID? What did... Tell us what so, that cluster ID is, Victor. Yes, we have our cluster that we just created. Um, and uh, this is an identity. We can have a name. We can change the name of this cluster. But a cluster ID is something that's fixed. That's something that you use to uh, to call support, saying, "Hey, support, um, I have a problems with cluster." And the support will ask you, "What's your cluster ID?" And this is why how they will be able to identify this. And also, this information about cluster ID will be using to retrieve some of the additional information with managing resources, like you're creating the keys, and so far and so on. Now, in this case, um, I will be able to do uh, this, so my cluster is this. So next thing is important, because we will create a uh, API key to connect uh, to our Kafka cluster. So uh, in order to connect, because we communicate through the open internet, we need to have a login and password. So in this case, we will not um, get this um, cluster to some, I don't know, Russian hackers, uh, trademark. Um, so in this case, we will have um, a CCloud API create the key for our cluster ID. And after that, we will store this API keys in our Kafka username and password. So once I've done this, I also need to say that my CCloud uh, CLI should use this key as well. Uh, because I want to use my CCloud CLI to produce data in and produce data out. So let me uh, quickly do a very quick round of the things for, uh, for the uh, folks who are first time with us and don't know anything about the Kafka. How about that? Is it uh, sounds good? So um, Kafka is a, a distributed system that um, consists of many machines. And uh, Kafka provides very interesting patterns of accessing your data. Your data stored in a format that's very easy to describe as a append-only file. So append-only file is you writing in the end of the file, you reading from the beginning of the file. The read and write operations there are um, uh, continuous, so there's no random randomness. Um, and uh, those um, those files they actually can be spread across multiple nodes of this uh, the Kafka system and uh, organized in the topics. So topic is the logical representation of the, how the data would be uh, stored. And um, 
Kafka um, borrows a lot of vocabulary from the messaging system. So that's why many people know the topics as a system where you can publish something and many consumers can read this. And Kafka has a lot of similarities with this. So the th first thing that we need to create this topic so we can start pu publishing some data. So in this case, I'll continue to do this in, uh, in my workshop document. I can go and say, see cloud, Kafka topic, create and the test topic. So in this case, uh, it will execute the command. And if I will switch to my UI, I will see this topic immediately here. I said immediately uh, test topic. By default, it will be used six partitions, meaning there would be some of the files that would be spread across multiple nodes of this cluster. And right now, there's nothing is going on there. There's uh, no produ uh, production, no consumption. So CCloud, the Confluent Cloud provides the UI, so you can see what kind of messages here. And let me actually produce uh, some of the messages. Remember, um, we're doing this from Google Cloud Shell. So we're writing data from uh, some machines that machine was created in the Google Cloud. Now, um, I'm just using this uh, the word test and I'm passing this through the pipe into uh, standard input of my test topic. Uh, Kafka topic produce and the message was successfully uh, landed and uh, I should be able to see this message here in just a second. So my message is here. And uh, what I can do here in, uh, in this case, uh, I can switch to pancake menu. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it looks like a hamburger, maybe like a double, uh, double, double. Um, I, I miss, uh, I miss uh, this. Ah, okay, oh, that's a rookie sure. mistake. Thank you so much for paying attention. Thank you so much for paying attention. <laughs> Yes, so uh, I didn't share the screen. Like, uh, I think it's one of the phrases of 2020. All right, so folks, <laughs> I am on the screen where I have a topic um, and I created this test topic by writing command that I have in my document. So create a topic. It's the our lab one, task five, step number four. So this is where we are right now. I created a topic and successfully produced the message. And now I was able to look into this, to this uh, topic through this uh, thing. In order to, like, sometimes I was uh, not struggled, but at least uh, many cases when you're explaining some technology, you do a lot of hand waving or you need to use slides or you need to use um, some of the, you know, whiteboard or, or things like that. So in this case, um, I can use the product itself to describe what it does. So I have my test topic here. And I can show you that all the data, this topic consists of multiple partitions. In this case, it's the uh, six uh, partitions. And uh, those partitions are spread across multiple nodes. And because it's a serverless, you really don't care about where those partitions are stored. We're taking care of the how this stuff can be uh, can be operated. So let me uh, let me do a couple things. So first of all, uh, let me start uh, producing some of the messages constantly to this topic. So we will see that um, I say hello, live streams, hi. Um, the um, and now I should be able to see that. Um, there would be another producer. Going back here, messages produced, and um, I also can click inspect and see what's the current throughput. Um, throughput is super low right now because I just produced a few messages, but you see it's just eight, eight, uh, 80 bytes, just a few. Um, so next thing uh, is to consume those messages, right? So uh, we can uh, produce these messages. Now let's consume this. And the uh, CCloud uh, CLI has this command that allows to consume. So I'm going here. Um, CCloud Kafka topic consume from beginning. B means the from beginning. So this is an interesting part of um, of, uh, of Kafka where messages are persisted and they won't disappear until um, uh, until the Kafka decides to do so. So in this case, they will be storing there, there's configuration that allows you to configure this retention, but if you consume the message from Kafka, 
it will not disappear. You can always uh, reread messages from very beginning. So in this case, what I do, my application was not available, was not running during the time where I produced those messages. So in this case, I need to um, um, read all these messages. So that's why I'm using this minus B from beginning. So, and it will wait for some time. Um, and after that, it should speed up all the messages in the, in the, um, that were available in the, in the Kafka topic. So all these messages just appeared. Um, and I can see if I go here in my, um, in my view, again, once again, I am going home. There is a default environment. There is a cluster that I'm using this, cluster zero. And inside this cluster zero, there's a data flow. Um, for this topic, I will already have a producer, but also what I can see in this um, consumers. There's one consumer in this case, it's Confluence CLI consumer, uh, number of consumers, my application is running, still running, still waiting for some messages. And I can see some additional information of this consumer. So how the partitions are spread across uh, the, uh, the consumer ID. Um, uh, um, so the, for some reasons, my um, uh, data flow is not uh, refreshed yet. Uh, it's supposed to. Uh, so I would see, I would see my uh, consumer here, but uh, it's still not there yet. Oh yes, this is my consumer. So in this case, you see full flow. We have a topic where we have a producer that writes data and a consumer that reads data. So, and uh, also I will be able to see what is going on there. I see um, how much uh, consumption here uh, happening for this consumer and so far and so on. Nothing is really happening, at least for now, because we didn't start generating this uh, messages data. So I do have a questions about the, the messages appeared in the screen and not in the same order how they were produced. Um, I guess it's, uh, I would like to answer this question with the phrase that um, uh, the Howard Stark, father of Tony Stark said. So I limited by technology of my time. Unfortunately, um, console consumers, they, um, they don't see the, the difference, how we can spread across multiple um, consumers and partitions and things like that. So if you will run this in application, your application uh, consumer will receive the message in the same order how it was produced. Uh, here, I, I believe the uh, CCloud CLI uh, standard output is just like a uh, fighting for um, standard output. So that's why some of the messages you can see out of the out of the order. So for example, test was the first, but high was first. Since CCloud CLI runs multiple consumers, and we can also see this in, um, in the screen, um, those consumers uh, were in uh, one consumer, like those three consumers that were racing. Uh, partitioning, partitioning at work, right? Yeah. So in this case, uh, it's uh, consumers in the consumer groups is the way how we can like do a parallel uh, a parallel um, uh, consumption. All right. So this is um, this is like a very like a one on one thing. If you want to learn uh, more like one on one stuff, um, as always, developer.confluent.io, folks. Like if you're first time here developer.confident.io. Um, there is a, a very extensive um, a doc that explains like step by step. Uh, if you go here and just find something like learn Kafka or something like that, um, there should be, yeah, start now. So um, if you click the start now, you will get to developer.confident.io learn Kafka and you will be able to watch, read in the code, uh, everything about uh, 101. Um, this is where you can learn this. We have a, a lot of uh, things to cover, but um, you will be in the good hands if you go and follow this one. All right. Uh, back to you, James, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. So we're going to, um, there's a few people that were having some challenges with some of the early stuff. So I'm going to just step back just a little bit so that we can try to get everyone uh, to where we're at. Um, and but before I do that, um, there was a question about guaranteed ordering, and Kafka does guarantee the ordering uh, across uh, within a single partition. So, 
Um, so there is guaranteed ordering within a partition. But I think in your case, Victor, you were actually uh, sending messages to multiple partitions, which is why they were not coming back in that same order when you consumed them. Yes, that was correct. Okay, okay. So um, I want to hop back and highlight just a couple things. So for some people, when they got into Confluent Cloud, it asked for a credit card. And what that means is that the linkage between your Google Cloud account and the Confluent Cloud account did not happen correctly. And so if that happened to you, then what you can do is hop back to our task three here and go to the Google Cloud console for the marketplace. And then, uh, it should take you, you've, you've already done the purchase, you've already done the enable, and now it says manage on provider. And if you click this manage on provider button, or alternatively, if you go into manage, then there's the button at the top, manage via Confluent. When you click that button, it should take you to Confluent Cloud. And if you are not logged into Confluent Cloud, then it's gonna ask you to create an account. What I had happened to me once before is I had a Confluent account already. And so I logged in with that Confluent account and that the account creation time is when it makes that linkage between Google Cloud and Confluent Cloud. So what you need to do is maybe create a new Confluent Cloud account so that you can get that linkage created. Uh, one nice way to do this, if you already, let's say you're using your Gmail account and you already have your Gmail email used for your Confluent Cloud account, you can use your username at, at Gmail, but then do a plus at the end of your username and then append something onto it, like plus yeah. SKK or something like that when you yeah, go and create Let me show you account. real quick. In this case, so this is how I set up my, my account. So this is case I'm using this Victor GCP live streams. So essentially, I already have accounts on Confluent, but I want to use GCP thing. So that's why I will um, use GCP as my like a plus thing. So in this case, if I go to my UI and I will show my uh, billing, it should be able to show me. Um, so this is what I should see. Our organization is currently linked to GCP marketplace. This is means that you are golden. You are doing the right thing here. All right. It's in a, so you, in a. Yeah. So it's, it's a little. This is definitely one of the trickier points is you need to have that linkage between your Google account and your Confluent Cloud account. And that happens when you click from the Google Cloud Marketplace, the, the Manage via Confluent button, and go in and create a con new Confluent Cloud account. So. And uh, there was a question about single sign-on. Single sign-on is available. Uh, we're not going to cover this today, but uh, you can learn more about this in documentation. So if you go to this hamburger menu, you will find this sign uh, single sign-on. That's where you can get uh, the information. Oh, um, you probably don't see it because of the, um, uh, the way how we showed our screen. Let me do this one. So if you go here, um, in this particular case, it would be a little bit tricky. Uh, so I'm going to this hamburger menu. I'll find this like a single sign on. And after that, I will be able to configure. But this is something that uh, you need to do if you understand what you're doing. So um, I'm bringing this up because there was some, some question about this in, uh, in the previous. Back to you, James. OK, so um, I've been following along. And I, in my cloud shell, was able to follow this the steps in task five, and I was able to install the C Cloud CLI. I was able to do the C Cloud login, and then I was able to set up some environment variables with my cluster ID, my Kafka username, and password. Um, and so I got through all those, but I stopped at step four, and I want to um, just walk through those starting at step four and uh, for any, anyone that's still catching up. So I'm going to go into my Cloud Shell, where I've done all those steps, and now I'm going to create my Kafka topic, and it's called test-topic. 
Great. So now topic created. So what some people ran into is that it does take a, a minute to provision the cluster and maybe a little bit of time to set up the topic. And so some people, when they ran this next command to produce a message into that topic, they got an EOF message. And uh, it looks like um, it worked fine for me there. So everything was set up. But if you're moving quickly through some of these steps, then it's possible things aren't quite ready for you yet. So if you get uh, on that step, a EOF message, then um, just try again in a minute. OK, so I sent my message. Now I can go in and consume my message here via the command line. And Victor showed you how you can also do uh, this stuff through the Confluent Cloud UI as well. So great, there we go. We see my, my test message. And uh, the next last thing for today for setup, we need to set up a KSQL DB. So um, we uh, announced that we're going to be using some serverless stuff. So KSQL DB is our ways how we can do um, serverless stream processing. So I would say uh, create a new application. Uh, once again, if you see my screen, you should see my screen. And now I'm double checking myself. Um, I apologize for that so if you miss a couple things, but uh, we, we, we think we did a great job to um, um, uh, get back to this and cover this once, one more time. So we'll see this create application, um, select the global access for now for development so we don't need to um, create any additional like uh, uh, the ACLs and things like that. And I click continue. Um, we can keep default, but uh, if you are feeling fancy, um, you you can increase uh, more streaming units. Streaming units is the ways how uh, this something can be built. Uh, in the beginning of our presentation, James was talking about the way how the the billing works in the cloud. Sometimes it's a for um, a storage. Sometimes it's for um, number of requests. Sometimes it's this you know something that's called. Um, um, the Confluent streaming units. You can learn about the sizing. There is a link to documentation and how this is calculated and what you will get as a result. And I click launch application. So uh, we want to do this first because uh, to provision this application will take some time. Um, and uh, meanwhile, we will cover some other uh, things in this one. And again, create my application myself. If you, um, um, if you see this, if you don't see the tutorial, I dismiss the tutorial. Global access, name application, keep the by, by default. And after that, you just launch this application. And that would be uh, the first uh, step of our, our um, like a setup. So let's see if we have any other questions. Yeah, so the hardest part's now over. <laughs> Hopefully, uh, most people are, were able to follow along and get everything set up. There definitely is some little gotchas there, making sure that we get the account linkage all done correctly. Um, but uh, we're happy to help you if you if you. We have a um, question about the charge. So, um, on the Confluent Cloud, you will have a uh, two hundred bucks uh, of the of the things that you can use for your test. It's uh, it's quite enough for you know for a week of development. Um, Again, stick around. I might have a surprise for you if you want. Um, if you want to use this, um, if you if you if uh, if you feel fancy. So um, so how did you get the Confluent Control Center? So you don't uh, by default. So this is uh, you will have a Confluent Cloud UI that allows you to see uh, pretty much same things that you can see in the Control Center. But we do have examples in our. Uh, demo repository in the GitHub, Confluent thing slash examples, where we can learn how you can connect um, um, uh, Control Center to Confluent Cloud. It's also possible to do. Um, so, you know, Top Victor, Squad. It, Top Squad got everything set up. You know, if we were in person, we would be like throwing out t-shirts for people to have gotten through the hardest part. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's... Uh, that's uh, and we will ask uh, Top Squad also assist to other people if we will have an, in a in a in a in a group. So usually uh, people who uh, get things done faster, they are uh, willing to help others. So uh, the question will we be able to demonstrate how to transform a bunch of JSON string into JSON schema today using KSQL DB? Uh, someone is jumping in front of gun. Yes, uh, spoiler alert. Yes, we this is gonna be what we're doing next. Uh, I have uh, that warning that to continue or something to fix. Um, 
uh, Edgar kindly a little bit more context. It's not quite clear what kind of uh, error. Um, ah, okay, so the, you're talking about this one. So yes, it's not warning. It's a, it's an informational message that your current cluster will be uh, used as a default cluster in your in your application. So you should be able to do this. All right. Um, uh, under inactive topic, I can see topic test topic. Yes. So like uh, the UI will be waiting until some of the data will be produced. So if you open this UI and uh, show, <clears throat> we can we can show this in the, in the, in the next screen while we start producing some of the real data because you know when you produce the message and uh, your UI expecting to get the live data. If you want to get the historical data from uh, from this cloud UI, so what you can do here, you go into this topic. Um, can you, uh, let me share, share the screen this time. Um, so you go into this test topic and if you want to see if there are some messages here, uh, there is a button here says um, or, uh, jump to offset. And this is where you can specify like a where to start reading this messages. So let me quickly refresh it. Uh, why it is appears here. So is there any leave a lesson? Yeah, thank you. I'm, I'm good. Uh, for some reasons, uh, my UI let's jump to offset, no offsets, let's see zero. Um, and this allows me to travel back in time. So I go into offset zero, this is the pointer. Offset is the index of my message. Let's just say partition two, one. So my message didn't have a key, so that's why uh, it was randomly distributed across this topic. Um, and I was able to go and reset my uh, offset to particular partition to find those messages. Um, if you're not providing key for Kafka message, Kafka will decide for you where to place it. If you provide the key, um, in this case, uh, it will always land on the same partition. So that's why this is how you can get this ordering through partition. Okay, uh, nothing is here. All right. So I think, James, it's a good time where we introduce our um, uh, trouble, troubleshooting uh, uh, section in the document because I start seeing the people having issues with uh, uh, cluster IDs now and, and things like that. Yep, yeah, so there are sometimes where environment variables don't get set correctly or get lost uh, and disappear like if Cloud Shell resets or something like that. And so if um, if you're having weird behavior in Cloud Shell with running some of the commands, one of the first things to check is that your environment variables are set correctly. You can do that uh, down at the very bottom. Oh, you know, unfortunately in the when we're in yeah, the I can, I can show mass this. viewer, okay. viewer um, yeah. mode, we don't see the outline of the document. But at the very bottom of the document is the troubleshooting where you can uh, you can echo out all your environment variables that we're using. Some of those may not have been set yet because we're still working through yeah. that. But um, but if you need to reset an environment variable then uh, in Cloud Shell, then uh, the easiest place, the easiest way to do that is to go back into the document where we set it. And can we do control find? Yeah, okay, we can do control F to find find in the document to look for like export space the name of the variable and reset that so in the case of jerry he uh looks like his cluster id was not set so go search in the document for where we when we set the cluster id and uh, rerun those those commands so this command usually is something around c cloud uh, kafka cluster list and uh, find the list, uh, cluster that um, that will fit uh, to to your need all right so the next thing is that we're going into something interesting, right? Um, <laughs> this is, Victor, this has all been interesting. <laughs> um, so people, uh, some people came here for Kotlin, some people came here for KSQL DB, some people came here for JSON schema, so uh, we don't want them to wait. So um, now, in, uh, as you can see on the James screen uh, or on my screen, uh, you see this is the place where you start getting the code. So in this case, a git clone uh, will copy a repository from, um, uh, from uh, James' GitHub account. Um, and uh, James will switch to his uh, Cloud Shell and uh, we'll show you how we can do this um, there. Yep. 
Yeah, so the source code that we're going to be working with is up on my GitHub. And so I'm going to now do this Git clone of that source code down into Cloud Shell. So now I've got that source code and we're going to be building and working with that source code. And so, um, so I want to just give you a, a quick overview of, of what the code structure looks like. And I've got it open here in IntelliJ and that's where I'm going to walk through it. But alternatively, button. Alternatively, if you want to stay just all cloud-based, there is this, this little open editor button up here in Cloud Shell. And if you hit that open editor button, it says, hey, welcome to Cloud Shell. We need to open a workspace and we can come in and select the directory that we just cloned, the serverless Kotlin Kafka directory, and open that. And now this will initialize the Cloud Shell editor and you can go explore the source code. We're not going to be editing any of the source code today, but uh, we will be explaining all the different parts of it. And, uh, and so you can, you can go explore that within the Cloud Shell editor. Uh, or of and course you can pull it down to your local and machine. That's pretty cool. ID of choice. Yeah, I mean, it's like, uh, it's like VS Code in the browser. I think it's, it is actually VS Code in the browser. OK, so now that I've got the source code locally, let me just show you a little bit of the structure for the, the project. Uh, and so you get an idea of, of where things are as we start to dive in further to the code. So I'm using Gradle for the build. So I have my root Gradle build, which just brings in some uh, Kotlin plugins and Spring plugins, really. And then I do have to add some uh, additional repositories here because we're pulling some different libraries from, from different places, not just Maven Central. OK, I have three sub projects within this. There's a common project, which is code that we share across the two different parts of it. There's the WS to Kafka, which is our bridge. It's going to read the WebSocket, that stream of Stack Overflow questions, and then send those to Kafka. And then I have the web UI project that is our web UI that's going to render that data. So those are our projects that we're going to be diving more into uh, in, in a minute. OK, um, there is one more thing we do need to set up uh, here, which, um, which should be pretty straightforward. We're going to do all of this in Cloud Shell. And this is the schema registry. And so. Um, Victor, how about I uh, I run these commands and then you um, show us what schema registry is and talk a little bit about it. Yes, we can talk about this once we yeah let's do this. So okay. uh, while the James is doing this uh, the commands, essentially we uh, need to um, tell the Confluent Cloud that we are interested in um, having a schema registry, which essentially is a service. Uh, that uh, available through REST, um, that will be performing one simple thing. It will allow you to extract some of the description of your data and uh, do not send this together with payload. So Kafka really doesn't care what you put in there. I know some people even putting some of the um, images and uh, music files inside the Kafka, um, and uh, there's nothing Kafka will do about this. Kafka do not introspect and really don't care. However, when we're writing microservices, in our case, uh, we have a few services that will be exchanging this information, plus we do have uh, some of the system that would perform our serverless logic uh, to with our data. These systems really do care about the uh, structure of this data. So that's why we will be uh, having this uh, service that will hold our schemas. So um, schema registry supports uh, schemas in the format of Avro, uh, Protobuf, uh, and uh, JSON, uh, JSON schema. And uh, so what it, what it will do, when the application needs to produce the data, Serializer will extract the schema register the schema if the schema was not registered with the schema registry and assign the schema ID that will be placed as a part of the payload. So next time when the application who needs to know what is going on there, it doesn't need to uh, um, have a jars in the class path that will include the schema. It will read this information from, uh, from schema, schema ID from the, from the from message, retrieve the schema from schema registry and after that will make sense of schema and data and after that you will have an object. So what the James is uh, uh, did is when he went um, 
into the cluster and uh, request it to create the scheme registry next to your cluster. And in, um, in your UI, you should be able to see something like this. You have a cluster, and after that, you will see the scheme registry. Schema registry usually assigned to particular uh, Kafka cluster. So in this case, I do have an API endpoint uh, to this scheme registry, and uh, there should be some keys. But essentially, uh, we have a, one cluster and one scheme registry that will be assigned for, for this cluster. Um, I, I, I think uh, scheme registry also available throughout the environment. So whatever environment uh, you have uh, these uh, clusters, uh, will can use the same uh, scheme registry. So there is a command that you can quickly run to validate that uh, your credentials are valid. So uh, you should get, um, if you run this command, you should get uh, empty JSON. Uh, if you have authorization error or something like that, meaning that something is wrong with configuring the scheme. So in this case, James has an empty JSON, uh, this bold um, uh, curly braces. That's what we uh, expect to have. Um, you should go and try to do this yourself. Let me also quickly check if we do have other things. All right, so looks like um, we're good to go from uh, from perspective of our viewers. And the um, next thing is that it's uh, just a convenience uh, because we the way how we configured these applications, um, um, remember we were talking about the portability and uh, Spring Boot framework itself has certain traits and inspirations that came from this 12-factor application um, design patterns. So with, uh, if the Spring Boot will find this particular environment variable set, it will automatically activate a profile that will use uh, these uh, cloud connections. Otherwise, it will run this with uh, local uh, development mode that will leverage test containers. Yeah, and so one of the ways that we can see that is, uh, and Victor, I'm still sharing, right? Yes, I use you still sharing. Cool. So um, in the readme for this this repo, uh, the um, serverless Kotlin Kafka repo, you'll see some instructions for how to run it in the different environments. And we use environment variables as the way to be able to change the connection information across different environments. So you'll see instructions in here for how we set environment variables and can run it against a Confluent Cloud, uh, Kafka and Schema Registry, or we can potentially just run via Docker on our local machine. And as long as we send those environment variables, and set those to uh, some values, then, then it will connect to that Kafka and schema registry. So the, the readme has more information on the, the using the environment variables for the, the portability there. But that's why we're using the environment variables is so that just so we can pass configuration to our applications. OK, so now I've I've set all my environment variables that are needed so that I can run the WS to Kafka project. So let me go actually run that one. And we're in the serverless Kotlin Kafka directory. And we're doing uh, Gradle and then WS to Kafka run. And so that's starting up an application. And this is going to take a couple minutes to download all the dependencies and do the compile. So while it's doing that, I wanted to show you what that actual application does. So I'm in the source code for WS to Kafka, and I have my Kotlin source code. And this is a command line application. So it is, um, it is not a web application. It's something we're going to run from the command line. And remember, this is just a simulator that's going to take a stream of data and push it into Kafka. And so what we have in here is we have a, a few pieces of configuration that are main application needs. We need the. Uh, Kafka topic configuration, and we need the Kafka template. And the Kaf Kafka template is parameterized with the key and the value. So the key is a string, and the value is a question. And so if we go look at question, question actually is over in our common project. It's a Kotlin data class that has some properties, a URL, a title, favorite count, view count, and if we scroll over a little more, tags and body. Tags are a list of string. OK, so that's our data class that we're going to be working with. And this is the data class that gets registered with the schema registry. So automatically for us, this, uh, this data class is going to be registered when um, we use the JSON uh, serializer. 
If you okay. can, uh, if you can yeah. open quickly this uh, Kafka producer configuration, uh, Kafka template configuration, uh, oh, yeah. whatever, or like whatever configuration, I want to show how this uh, thing is, is working. So in, no, 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 in uh, application that properties. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. So in application the properties, there is a cool parameters that we need to set. Is the key serializer and value serializer. Uh, for key serializer, we're using the standard string serializer that comes with Apache Kafka. And for um, uh, for our payload, we're actually using Kafka JSON schema serializer. So um, to answer the question that we had earlier in the chat, that's um, this is where. Um, the magic will happen essentially. So once the James will start uh, producing these messages, we will switch to a UI and we'll see how this, uh, um, how immediately uh, CCloud or Confluent Cloud UI would be smart enough to figure out the payload. So this serializer will take care of the turning this uh, Kotlin data object into um, uh, the JSON object plus extract a schema and publish the schema in the schema registry. Yeah, so it just happens all magically behind the covers for us. Now the topic creation part comes from this Kafka topic config. And so we are reading some configuration from that application.properties file for the number of re replicas, partitions, and the name of the topic. And then we create a bean, which is of new topic. So what, what the Kafka support in Spring Boot does is it looks at startup time to see, are there any new topic beans? And if they are, then it goes and tries to create create the topics for those. And so that's why we don't have to worry about uh, manually creating the topic that we're using here. It, uh, it does that for us. And we can go look at the application.properties and see our configuration is the topic name is my topic, three replicas, and eight partitions. OK, now back to our main command line application that we're running. What we're doing is we're opening a WebSocket connection to that stream of Stack Overflow questions. We are uh, creating a, a JSON mapper uh, with Jackson. And the reason for that is that we are using snake case as the naming strategy for that thing. And now here's, here is the whole entire guts of this application. What it's going to do is it's going to read the WebSocket, and it's going to parse the data that we're getting off the WebSocket into a question. And then it just prints out the question URL. And then it uses the Spring Kafka template to then send a message to Kafka with the, uh, the topic name. The URL is the ID, the key of the message, and then the question is the body of the message. Uh, so, James, can you uh, um, kind of like uh, minimize the project window in this case? So oh, yes, sorry. Code. Yeah. Yep. There we go. That's better. Yeah, so we're using Spring's Kafka template, which is injected in. Uh, you remember up in our main, we inject in that Kafka template. And so that's uh, then all configured underneath the covers by Spring using the application.properties, which uses the environment variables to set up the connection to our Kafka service on Confluent Cloud. And then a main method that just runs our application. OK. So let's go check back in on Cloud Shell and see that, sure enough, my questions are now streaming to Kafka. We can see that's outputting those question URLs. And, uh, and so that all looks good. Um, Victor, do you want to walk us through? Are you streaming? Do you want to walk us through the UI in Confluent Cloud where we can see that this is all actually working in, in uh, Confluent Cloud and Kafka? Yes, I am. Um, so if you having this uh, authentication failed uh, type of um, errors in your um, in your code, um, it might worth to wait a few uh, seconds. Maybe there's a kind of like a, you found this like a very uh, there's a sweet spot, but there's a not super sweet spot uh, during the uh, <laughs> during the time where uh, some of the functionality not fully propagated to a newly created cluster. So um, I hit exactly the same spot right now with the um, <laughs> with this particular case and my notification fails. So that's why we need to rely on your UI, James. Um, and we will I will walk you through the um, uh, I will walk you through this one. So you you got a author? I think a few other people yeah. maybe got an author too. Let Let me see if I do have it. Uh, yeah, so failed uh, for some of the people. Um, 
uh, let me see if I do have a, yeah, it might, it cannot create the, uh, um, let me quickly check. So consistency in distributed systems, it is a very, very hard thing. So that's why um, eventual consistency is the best that we can do, uh, unfortunately. Um, okay, let me try this one more time. Um, otherwise, like James will show the same thing that happens in uh, uh, in uh, in his UI. Yeah, and it looks like maybe some people artifact downloading failed. Uh, just try again. Just uh, sometimes, you know, networks are flaky. That's uh, one of the rules of distributed systems, right? And so, um, so if if for some reason artifacts failed downloading, then just uh, start that process again, and hopefully we can get everyone's. Uh, Great old Maven caches, um, all all set and going. All right, so I think I uh, I passed that um, unpleasant uh, uh, inconsistency window. So the way how it looks like right now, um, we just print out the Stack Overflow questions. Those are real questions. If you will click the, this link to, you will be able to take into Stack Overflow. But let's take a look how the Confluent Cloud sees it. So we go into this. We're going to Victor, this cluster. You share your screen, are you sharing yours? I, I do, I do, I do. Okay. Yes, thanks so much for checking in, Jack, uh, James, because, uh, <clears throat> yes, guilty as charged. So, uh, you will find this topic uh, called My Topic. And uh, if you go click messages here, since the messages are flowing constantly right now into this, you will be able to see this in the real time. All the messages are coming in here. But what you also will notice that we have this topic and now we have this new tab called schema. And if you go and click here, you will see that our value actually um, have some information about the structure. So in this particular case, we're using this uh, JSON schema, json-schema.org uh, format for describing JSON schema. And this information also stored inside our um, inside our schema registry. So if I will go back to my cluster schema registry uh, tab, I will see that there is a bunch of um, uh, view managed schemas. I will see a bunch of different schemas, but what we actually care here is this thing. So this combination of topic name and the value or key, we call it the subject. So the subject, the way is how the scheme registry will be able to distinct uh, schemas. So in this case, we know that this subject, my topic value, we know this in the topic, my topic uh, value will be serialized with this format. And this is the scheme ID. This is what I was talking about. Based on the payload that will start in the Kafka, we will be able to true um, uh, track this and get access to the schema here. So, um, and uh, the, the, the some other tools, we will show how the schema will be use, uh, used in um, <clears throat> In uh, in uh, SQL DB uh, because uh, this is something that we will be using um, and it would be like very very important thing to to use. Uh, once again, if I go to this particular topic, uh, now I see a lot of messages are coming in. I can see like whole workflow and see what is going on there. Some of the uh, how the application produce messages and uh, things uh, things like that. So we will get back to topic. Let's see what we have here in terms of um, in terms of data. We do have a object that uh, we turn our Kotlin um, question. So we do have this SRC main Kotlin question, and as you can see here, so we also provided a hint. So the JSON property would be called not the forward count as we have it in uh, camel case in Java, but rather it's called snake case, James? Snake case, yeah, that's the underscore. So that's why it, this came in into the, the in this format. Also, we do have uh, some of the, uh, uh, the question body. So we will also do some of the, um, not obfuscation, but rather escaping, right? So we escaping the scene. So that's, uh, that's what you should be able to see right now. Um, there's no header and the key, since it's a regular string, then uh, this UI will be able to deserialize it and make sense of it. So that's uh, that's what we have. Let's see uh, if we have any other questions. So uh, thanks, James, for helping uh, uh, people to reset. And it looks like uh, um, Ashish successfully uh, fixed this issue. 
Um, so if you see this error on your screen, meaning that's unknown topic partition, usually it means that the topic was not successfully created. So there's a two things that you can use to create those topics. Um, well, like one thing. So the James that showed you that this bin that has a new topic uh, type, um, this bin uh, will be passed through this API called admin client. So Kafka has three types of APIs to interact, the clients can interact with it. It's a producer API when you're writing data in, it's a consumer API it's when you're reading data out, and there is an admin client that allows you to perform some admin functions. Creating a topic is admin functions. So if you failed uh, admin, func uh, admin, um, sorry, admin client failed to authorize with this Kafka topic, uh, it will not be able to create this topic. And since by default we disabled auto topic creation, you will see this error. So in this case, recommendation, just wait a few seconds and restart the application where the keys from um, Kafka and uh, username and password will be fully propagated and you will be able to, uh, to continue to do uh, things in, in um, continue to do well, this. It's also possible that an environment variable wasn't set because uh, we need those environment variables for the bootstrap servers and username and password for Kafka. So for someone Kafka is running in, in front of the uh, train uh, yeah, too fast. Riz, Riz, so, is, Riz is uh, way out at the end. So Yeah, um, he's, Riz, he's, he's, well, he's, he's crashing it, yeah. <laughs> so we'll help you with stick that. around, yeah. Riz. Uh, we will uh, take take care of this. Uh, so this is the error might be related to some uh, things related to KSQL DB connectivity. So we will uh, show you how we can uh, investigate this. All right. So any other questions, folks? Um, uh, so yes, you still can do uh, this uh, locally anytime. So as long as you have a CCloud CLI installed uh, locally. So essentially, everything that we would do in Cloud Shell can be done in any uh, Linux and Unix compatible terminal. So you should be able to do this uh, without any problems. You should be able to do that. Um, um, and again, I see some of the errors uh, with regards of the um, um, check, for example, your uh, your ID. Check if this particular cluster ID was successfully set in your in your environment. All right, so um, we will continue to run this. <laughs> All right, so oh, Thank that's that's what I love. Like I I, I love the the positive uh, enforcement. Thank you so much. Um, uh, thanks so much, Sharon. Um, so far, so far, so good. Wait until, like, wait, there's more. <laughs> All right. So um, I'm switching to uh, Jay's, uh, James' screen. Um, and James, you are on. Great. So I'm producing these uh, Stack Overflow questions into Kafka. Um, so that's, that's good. I have gotten through lab two. And now we need to move on to the next step, which is to transform our stream. And we want to do this in a serverless way. So I don't need to manage servers, and I only pay for what I use. And so we're going to use KSQL DB as the way to do this transform. And so I need to set up a, a few environment variables so that my application knows how to talk to KSQL DB. Uh, and so there's um, in lab three, task one, there's some instructions here for how to do that. I'm going to hit control C to cancel out of my running application for now so I can continue, right, uh, continue uh, through the instructions here. And that should now set those environment variables. And at any point, if you need to like check that something is an environment variable is set correctly, we should be able to copy in the um, name. So echo dollar sign the name of the environment variable. And it looks like that's set. That's great. OK, so with those environment variables set, now we can um, talk about how we're going to actually do the transform. So to do that, let's hop over to the code because all this actually happens over in uh, in the web UI code. So we um, we need to have somewhere to set up the streams, the KSQL DB streams and tables. And so uh, I wanted this to be in code. And so I just actually put this into my um, my main web application where it sets these up. So I'm just going to show also, you one part. 
minimize your uh, project view. Thank you. Yep, perfect. Okay. Um, so I have in my my um, I have a component, a Spring Boot component that uh, I take in a reactor client, and the reactor client is what allows us to connect to KSQL DB. And then I also take in my Kafka topic config. And when my application has, has uh, initialized, then I'm going to go and run some uh, KSQL DB commands uh, against KSQL. Um, and so, Can you scroll uh, line 56 yeah. a little bit for me? And I will tell you one quick thing. So as you can see here, yep. when we create in the stream, we also create uh, the stream if it doesn't exist. Uh, if it already exists, we'll just skip it. Uh, and an interesting thing that when we said the width, uh, we can specify two things. We can specify which topic we can use as a stream so we can uh, make sense out of the stream. And important thing is that we have this thing called value format. And the value format, this is information that KSQL DB will use to um, infer structure. And where it will get this, it will query this information from schema registry. It will introspect this schema and figure out that, oh, it looks like this payload is my JSON. So in this case, I don't need to uh, manually create the structure saying, oh, I do have a favorites, I do have a view count, I do have a tags, and so far, and so on. So in this case, it's uh, really handy to use schema because not only your your tools, your Java apps, your Kotlin apps, your Scala apps, or some, some other apps that also can know how to talk to schema. But also serverless component like uh, schema, uh, KSQL DB can use this information to introspect your data. So it's a better user experience, better uh, developer experience, and the less uh, mistakes. You're using the same schema. So in this case, uh, it will be a stream will use the same information. Yeah, so I'm just using my web application, which we're going to start uh, and run on Cloud Run in a little bit. Um, I'm just using that to to bootstrap the creation of my streams. There are a number of different ways to do that. One way that I could do that is actually through the Confluent Cloud uh, in the KSQL DB in my cluster. I can go to my application. And now I've got this editor where I can come in and say, let's uh, create stream and then Let's create stream as select. Oop, doesn't like to auto-complete that. Tab completion, there we go, tab. OK, so I can create a stream, and then I can do a select. I can uh, hook this up to a Kafka topic like we're doing there. I can do um, selects. Uh, so a number of different ways to actually do this creation. Um, but for the KSQL DB streams and tables that we're using, I just do those in my web application. Okay. So KSQL um, DB itself uh, provides uh, uh, HTTP to based uh, like uh, interface, so um, the streaming also will be possible. Um, but also <clears throat> in this application, we're using a, a reactive uh, Java client that allows to um, perform this this type of stuff. That's right. Yep. Yeah. So just an easy way to to do this um, this these setup steps that I needed. Uh, there are other ways that we could have done this as well. So that's my uh, KSQL DB setup. Um, Victor, do you want to tell us a little bit about streams and tables in KSQL DB? Yes, of course. So <clears throat> in order to um, operate with um, data that plays in Kafka topic, Kafka doesn't introspect anything. So Kafka doesn't do any additional information. So for Kafka, it's just a sequence of uh, messages that have uh, some, you know, some payload, right? And uh, in order to start producing this, um, we, the developers come up with these abstractions. One abstraction is called stream that allows to represent a sequence of events in the Kafka topic in a way that uh, we can perform certain operations on the stream. So if you think about this, it's very similar to Java, uh, Java util stream some sort of sequence, and you can navigate through the sequence in uh, only order from, from beginning to the end. Um, and uh, usually stream represents a history of uh, certain facts, like a stream of events that happen in your life. It also represents some of the, um, some of the things that happened. Um, if you think about this also, uh, if um, 
any type of sequence, like some of the uh, transactions that happened with your account, uh, those transactions represent as a stream of um, action or certain transactions. So your ledger uh, has a history. A table, on the other hand, is an interesting concept that allows not only uh, if you don't care about the history, but you care about state. And this is where things are getting interesting, right? So you need to find a way how you can accumulate this result. So in the in banking industry, you can think about this ledger. It's your stream, it's your history, but the current balance is your table. So you um, accumulate this result somewhere. Or if, uh, I don't know, James, if you've seen this uh, new hot movie called uh, Queen's Gambit, um, it was uh, kind of like a, a small uh, the, uh, TV show in uh, Netflix, and, uh, and all of a sudden uh, people start interested in chess. So here's the chess analogy for you. So with the, um, with the stream, you actually go in and recording all your moves in the piece of paper, and all these moves go in particular order. And placing or position particular figures on the board will define the current state. So essentially, if any time, given a moment of time, someone just like uh, crashed your board and you lost your state, you will be able to uh, reread all these uh, steps that happened in your, all the moves that happened, that you captured, you will be able to restore the state. And also you can, you know, go back and forth if you need to, you know, get back in the past. Same thing applies to stream processing. You have stream of events that represents a history of facts, and you have a table that represents current state. So we're going to be using this concept to um, capture some of the information. In our case, we're going to be interested in counts, and we will be interested in some uh, in some summary of the of the things. Right? That was great. Yeah, I. Um... I like the chess analogy because, you know, we've got our ledger of all the moves, but then we can also do, and in chess it doesn't, um, maybe if you were reading through all the moves and wanted to replay those, that's great. But the nice thing about streams that it gives us also is the ability to do transformations and aggregations and different operations on the stream of data as well. And in chess, maybe there's a use case for that, maybe not. But yep. then, uh, yeah, having the having the materialized state and being able to recreate that materialized materialized state by replaying all the events is a really nice model. If and by having switch, that, yeah, I'll just like give you. Yeah, I will give you exactly. You have open this uh, uh, open this query on your screen. So can you scroll a little bit up? So we can yep. uh, show you how you can do a couple things here. So with the stream, you can perform so-called stateless transformation. So in this case, you don't need to know the result of previous step in order to calculate the current step. So in this case, uh, here's the example for you. We do have this uh, array of tags that attach to a particular question, but in order for us to calculate um, some, some sort of um, aggregated value for a particular tag or for a particular language or for a particular uh, word, we need to uh, what we call it in uh, functional programming, we need to do a flat map. So we can take a stream of events and after that produce another, like a bigger stream. Um, in case SQL DB, we call it explode. That lingua was, was um, inherited from some uh, SQL uh, based databases. So in this case, we don't really care what uh, previous message was. We just want to transform and uh, create more messages. So that's why we're using the explore here. And we're creating a stream that for each message that comes into input stream, we'll have uh, n messages based on the number of tags that we have in input stream. In uh, contrary, yeah, if you can, yep. So Go when ahead. a message comes in, if it has a tag, if it has a list of tags that contains Java, JavaScript, and Git, then all of a sudden our stream now has three messages instead of that one. Correct. Exactly. And on the contrary, now we need to do uh, aggregation uh, and in order to aggregate we need to you know in order to do count we need to know result of the previous step so we need to store the state somewhere i would like to quote uh, my colleague uh, gwen shapira when she said it's all fun and games 
until you need to deal with state. And uh, as I know, James was uh, very keen on avoiding dealing with state on uh, his professional career, and someone has to do this. So this is where the key sequel db comes into play. So when we do this count, and the key sequel will have this like internal state and will store this for you. So the next time when the next message will comes in for a particular attack, it will just automatically in increment this, and uh, this uh, uh, result will be always available for us to query. So we can do select something from particular table where tag equals Java. Awesome. Okay, so that's. KSQL DB streams and tables, and you can see what we've set up for those uh, two different ones. We have uh, one table that is our count of number of questions by tag, and then we have another table which is going to be our sum, our rolling sum of all favorite counts across all questions. So those are the two different uh, stateful things that we want to be able to use from our um, from our web application. Okay, let's hop back and sometimes Confluent Cloud will log you out um, because I haven't used it in a few minutes or something like that. So I'm gonna log back in here. And let's go back now to our instructions. So for lab four, what we're gonna be doing is running a web application that is going to take those tables and then render that, the, that data uh, out to the browser. So we're going to be running this on a serverless platform on Google Cloud called Cloud Run. And Cloud Run takes Docker containers. So <clears throat> underneath the covers with a lot of the stuff we've been doing is Docker containers. And so we need to take our application that we've been working with, our serverless Kotlin Kafka application, and turn the web application into a container. And then we'll be able to deploy that onto Cloud Run. I want to um, just show you a quick little uh, demonstration of how Cloud Run works. And I'm going to do this in a different browser window so that I don't screw up what I'm currently working on. <laughs> This part you certainly don't That's don't follow important. along with. <laughs> that is um, okay. I uh, on the Google Cloud Platform GitHub there is a Kotlin samples repo, and then there is a directory here called Run, and it contains a bunch of uh, basic different server applications with different frameworks. There's Spring Boot, Quarkus, Micronaut, Ktor, gRPC, Kotlin. Um, uh, HTTP for K. Um, but what I'm going to show you is just this plain hello world Kotlin example that I'm going to run on Cloud Run so that you can see the different pieces of Cloud Run. There's this little button that I can click on this repo to do the deployment. This is going to take me into Cloud Shell and automate a few steps of deployment for me. And I'm going to say, yes, I trust that repository because I wrote it. And then it's going to provision my Cloud Shell machine, connect to my Cloud Shell. You'll see that it has cloned that Git repo that I am uh, that I was looking at. I'm going to authorize Cloud Shell to make calls on my behalf. I'm going to use um, my JW demo project in this case. I'm going to deploy to the US Central One region. And now what it's going to do is it's going to say, all right, uh, you want to deploy the plain Hello World application. So what we need to do to do that is create, create a, a Docker, Docker container. container. Oh, oh and, and Victor, I got Victor, some I got echo. echo. Um, so it's going to do Maven package. And then it's going to use a tool called Jib. And Jib is one way that you can package applications into Docker containers. It's a tool for um, Java build systems, so, so Gradle and Maven. And then I tell it where I want to store that container image. So I'm storing it up on the Google Container Registry in the JW demo project and with the name of plain uh, Hello World. So that is now finished creating that Docker container image and then and stored it onto the Google Container Registry. And now we can tell Google Cloud, deploy that container uh, with that image, deploy it in US Central One, uh, use the Manage platform. You can also do this on, on the Kubernetes engine, the Google Kubernetes engine, uh, alternatively, if you want, and allow an unauthenticated access. And then my application has been deployed. So now I can open this very plain uh, Kotlin server project, and we see via an HTTPS endpoint with a domain, we get a response now with my hello world. 
We can then open up the Google Cloud console where we can go in and see the like UI management console for Cloud Run, where that container is running um, and information about it. We hasn't been running very long, so we can't see a whole lot of, or it's not getting very many requests. We can see revisions. So I've done this before. So we can see different revisions that I've deployed. I can of course roll back. I can use managed traffic to do blue green deploys, canary deploys, that sort of thing. I can uh, go to logs, see the, the standard out from my application and uh, other things in there. Uh, I can also go in and set up continuous deployment for this application. So that's Cloud Run. It's, uh, it's like Victor said, it's serverless. It's a platform as a service uh, for container images. So container images are the uh, essentially the zip file that you give it, the 12 factor or cloud native uh, formatted application that you give Cloud Run, and then it'll manage it, it'll scale it. Um, let me go back real quick so I can show you the scaling piece of, of this as well. Um, and this is, if we go to a, a revision, we can see some information about the capacity for this application. You'll see that I've allocated one CPU and 256 megs of RAM. I've set the concurrency to 80, that's just the default. What that means is that for a single server uh, underneath this, there's a, there's a server that has to run to handle these requests. I'm telling it that it can handle 80 concurrent requests. And then uh, if I'm at zero requests, I'm not going to have any instances running. If I'm between one and 80 concurrent requests, then I'm going to have one instance running. If I'm at 81, I'm going to have two, so on and so forth. And so that controls how many instances. And the instances are what I get billed for, not based on number of requests, but based on the number of actual instances that are running underneath the covers here. And then there's auto scaling. With auto scaling, I can set both a minimum number of instances and a maximum number of instances that I want to uh, automatically scale to. So the default is scale down to zero and scale up to 100. But of course, I could change those min and max numbers to be whatever I want. You'll see that there's a place to set environment variables, which is how we get our configuration in. And then there's a place to set up connections to Cloud SQL, VPC connections, uh, that sort of thing. OK, so that's our quick run through on Cloud Run and deploying containers. But what we want to do is I'm going to just close out of all this. And we're going to go deploy our serverless Kotlin Kafka application up on Cloud Run, which is going to create our KSQL DB streams and tables. And, uh, and then we'll also run our web application. So you there know, I is. I just realized that. Um... You're still trying to avoid uh, storing the state in your application. So that's why Cloud Run, no states, <laughs> ephemeral, right? And the state right. will be stored in KSQL DB uh, database. The motto of my life is make state someone else's problem. So, yep, that's that's what I'm doing, making it Put your problem. On the letterhead. You. Yep. <laughs> Okay, so here we are back in lab four, step uh, task zero. You'll see that we are now zero based, where the other ones were one based, um, because hey, why not try to make array numbering uh, base numbering confusing for everyone. Um, and so I've, I've outputted my environment variables that we're going to be using. And it looks like they're all set. If yours are not set for some reason, you need to go back to where those were set and reset them. Now I need to list my uh, Google Cloud projects. So we'll do um, G Cloud projects list. And when I do this, Cloud Shell is now making a call on, on my behalf to the Google Cloud APIs. And I need to authorize it to do that. So now it will list the projects out. Uh, most of you should just have one project. Um, and oh, no, I don't have a. <laughs> let's try that one more time. And there we go. Works. Uh, if it doesn't work the first time, just try it again. There we go. And so now I get my projects. This is the one that I'm using today. And so then we need to set an environment variable with that value. And so I'm going to export project ID equals. And I'm going to copy, make sure I copy the whole thing here, and paste in that project ID. So whenever we interact with Google Cloud, we need to tell it what project we're talking about.
We are going to be using some new APIs in, on Google Cloud, and so we have to enable those APIs. There's the Cloud APIs container, container registry, and Cloud Run. And so let's enable those APIs. And that'll take a minute to run to go through and uh, enable all those APIs so that, so that we can do that. But um, while we wait for that, Victor, any questions or problems that people have had? I see a few people actually running uh, in front of us um, and uh, uh, having some of the compilation errors. We will get to this one. I see some of the uh, praises. Um, this is for you, James. Top uh, class <laughs> GCP stuff. Um, awesome. Uh, so, and, Victor, some uh, people are having a hard time getting that, that reactor ksql db jar file. Um, that's, where's that one coming from? It's actually coming from uh, uh, JITPACK, so um, it should be no problem for um, for for you know for anyone. So it's coming from uh, JITPACK, and you have this repository you know set in your um, in your build. Uh, in the build cradle, yeah. Yes. Um, I'll try to um, check this myself. Um, meanwhile, while, while we're deploying this, right? So, so my um, this is going to be fun because my cloud shell just uh, lost its connection, and so now I um, get to go reset my environment variable. So, um, so if that happened to you, uh, unfortunate, it happened to me too. Um, you know, I guess things uh, sometimes go down in the cloud. Um, so I'm going to reconnect. Let's let's let me just go back real quick and make sure see if my environment variables are still set. So this should be. Uh, da -da. I'm on page 18. Let's see if these are set in Cloud Shell. Okay, luckily I did not lose my environment variables this time. Sometimes, sometimes you do, um, but I still have my environment variables, so that's good. Um, let's make sure that my project ID is set. Okay, looks good. And I'm going to just rerun this um, API enable command and it's okay if they're already enabled, but I wanna make sure that they are all enabled. Looks good. Okay, now we are at uh, task three, three in lab four where we are going to build our container image from our source code. And so it looks like this is where maybe some people are having some issues getting some dependencies. So we'll see what happens for me here. But this will now uh, run um, on the, oh, I am getting some, Reactor ksql db missing. Check. Oh no, actually this error is okay. That's um, that one is fine. That's a, that's a normal error. But this one, um, it can't find uh, search. Yeah, for some reason it's using the wrong uh, uh, repository. So in this case, it should use a JIT pack repository. Uh, can you check in your um, the build yeah. gradle? Yeah, so uh, I'm going to use VI, but if you if you do want to go explore the oh. build.gradle, then then you can open the Cloud Shell editor. So let's go see what's going on here. So here's our repositories. For some reason, it is saying just it can't move find this, it. Uh, yeah, just move this little bit back uh, one up. higher. Yep. Let's try that. Let's retry that. Weird is it only searched that one? Yeah, that's also repository. Weird. It should have it should have searched all of them, I think. But let's see if uh, let's see if maybe it'll work this time. Okay, yeah. good. It's building. All right. So so for those of you that um, maybe that was the magic fix, uh, you yeah. can use uh, your favorite command line editor, or you can open the Cloud Shell editor and go to, this is in the root build.gradle.kts file. And what we did was we just um, changed the order and moved jetpack.io above the MuleSoft repo. So hopefully that is a viable workaround for you all. Yep. Okay, so what's actually happening now is I've told the web UI boot build image task to run. And this is 
Spring Boot has built in support to create a container image for this, this uh, project, for this, this um, Spring Boot project. And so it's using something called Build Packs, which are the Cloud Native Computing Foundation standard for transforming source into a container image. And so it's now running that task and, and taking my code for my web UI and building that into a container image. And you'll see that these are all the steps that it's walking through. Um, uh, it is detected that I need Java 11, which is good. I do need Java 11. And then it's going to build the source code into the jar files and then assemble the whole container image. And then so it James, store is it yeah. it's not it's not jib anymore, right? It's something else. This one is not using jib. Yeah. So because Spring Boot has built in support for creating container images, I just used that. Uh, in the previous example that I showed with Cloud Run, I used jib because I wasn't using Spring Boot. It was just a plain one. So there's um, and we also could have just used build packs on the on the plain example as well. A number of different ways to go from source code to a container image. Um, if uh, jib uh, yeah, build I, I packs will do a, are, I will do a shameless blog for James because he's too polite to do this um, but I don't care if you want to learn more about the differences between different ways how you can package your application using docker using jib using build packs go Google uh, go Google <laughs> go uh, find <laughs> go on Google. YouTube video or James Ward uh, docker um, uh, what's the name of this uh, of this talk like, it's called uh, uh, comparing containerization methods or something <laughs> Yes, um, I will find this. I will try to find this uh, link, and we will also attach this one. Cool. So that's okay. a good talk so where the James covers everything. So if you're interested in this one, my container image is created, but it's just on the local Docker daemon, which is local to Cloud Shell. Now I need to do Docker push to push that image up to the Google container registry. So this is going to take all the layers because it's the first push that I've done of this container image. One thing nice about Docker containers is that because of the layering, there's actually great caching support. So if we were to do another push where we only changed a piece of source code, then it's actually going to push a lot faster because it's really only probably one layer that was that had actually changed. And so that's a nice thing um, with, with Docker container layering. Over in the Google Cloud console, if you do want to go check this out, um, there is in here in this giant long menu on the left, there's the container registry. And we can see in here, here is my container, SKK Web UI. And we can see the, uh, the name, the tag, and uh, you'll see that it was created on December 31st, 1979, but it was uploaded just now. And the reason why it says it was created back then is because um, in order for container images to be, uh, to make it so that, so that no matter when you create one, there aren't any differences, they always uh, build pack set the creation date of that to be that December 1st, 1979 date. Um, which what I don't happens think that's, on uh, December that's 19, e the December 31st on 1970? Is that is, it, uh, is that talking about epoch uh, epoch zero, like when the Unix epoch was zero or something? Maybe. Yeah, I, th I think um, maybe it's somehow related, to, or it's a 96. You know. Um, I don't know. Good question. Good trivia for anyone. Yeah. Write down in the comments if you're watching this uh, in the recording <laughs> or write this in the live chat. Um, what. Um, what this what, uh, what happened on December <laughs> yeah what, on, on December 31st 1979 okay okay so now we're going to deploy our application on cloud run and you saw this command before the G cloud run deploy when we deployed that plane application but this time we're deploying the skk web ui container image that we just created and we're giving it a little more memory this time because um why not and then we're setting some environment variables. So again, you're going to have to make sure that those environment variables are actually set because you're, this application is going to need all six of those environment variables to do what it needs to do. So let's uh, copy this command and go over into Cloud Shell and paste that command in. And so now you'll see that, um, that Cloud Run is deploying that container image with those environment variables. And it's going to take a minute for everything to be initialized and the first revision deployed and all that kind of stuff. So, But then our application should be up and running. And I know that some people got some errors with the web application. So we'll see if I get lucky or if I get an error. <laughs> Um, in interesting point here that uh, um, 
this is um, the, the currently application might not use uh, the Kafka servers, but it uses just like a KSQL DB endpoint. Uh, but um, yeah. So the reason why I set them was environments variables. Yep. I. Um, last night, Victor, at like way too late at night when I was getting some of this stuff working, I realized that <laughs> that I had moved the new topic stuff uh, where ah, Spring Boot into, creates the new topic. I'd moved, I, because I moved it into the common project and my web project depended on the common project, now all of a sudden I had the topic creation stuff in my web project, right. which then meant I needed to be able to have the Kafka admin stuff uh, be able to to work without you know throwing errors and so that's the reason why i am still passing the kafka bootstrap servers and kafka username and password and i could have fixed it um but it was too late at night and i gave up and said hey let's just pass those environment variables in yeah and uh, you can find this uh, uh github demo and you can sell pull requests uh, so Okay, somebody um, was asking about the changes to the Gradle file. So let yeah. me, while this is Can you deploying, bring this, uh, yeah, bring let's. This, uh, IntelliJ? Yeah, I'm going to do it in the Cloud Shell editor. Um, yeah. So that that's that'll probably be an easy way for people to go in and make this change. So I opened the editor, and then I had to open in Cloud Shell the workspace for my serverless Kotlin Kafka project. And then right in that directory, there's a build.gradle.kts file. And we changed the order where instead of trying the MuleSoft repo, uh, it uh, before that tries JIT, uh, Jitpack. Tell us what Jitpack is, Victor. Yes. So Jitpack, as, as a matter of fact, I do have it. Uh, I do have it open, so I can quickly switch my screen. So James will grab a glass of water. And uh, <laughs> so Jitpack is actually a very good tool uh, if you are developing something, but. Uh, uh, want to just share the, with the world immediately. So essentially, it is a combination of uh, the repository for your um, artifacts, but also um, CI, CD system. And the way how it works, it takes your GitHub project and automatically introspects and figures out what kind of build uh, technology do you use. It builds it and publishes this, uh, this um, the jars so it will be available uh, for you to consume in your application. So in this particular case, if I'll take the Maven, um, I just need to add this uh, repository. If I use Gradle in this case, I just put this uh, repository in Jitpack. And this is how I define the particular um, application. So in this particular case, this reactor KSQL DB library, uh, it's part of my GitHub. And um, um, the, the Jitpack is actually built it. So I can see the log from this uh, CI system and like how it built it, run the test and things like that. And uh, after that, it is available for me to consume. So in this case, in my application, I just need to specify this as a dependency. Um, it's pretty neat when you need to quickly share some of the um, <clears throat> some of the jars, like without uh, copying and pasting uh, code around. And I think uh, what happens here is just uh, the Gradle uh, took the precedence and tried to look up uh, this library not in this particular repository, on, in the uh, MuleSoft repository where, you know, there's no uh, my library there. But, um, um, and uh, you can use this to build for a particular branch or for a particular commit uh, or just from master. That's, um, I think this is how I rolled in this case. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, this is how, <laughs> this is how we roll with the, uh, uh, with the open source tools and stuff like that. And now the moment okay. of truth, we have this uh, service it's... URL. Okay. So yes, our, Application has been deployed, and we've seen a few people have some issues uh, at this point with the application. So we're going to go um, see if it worked for me. So what I'm going to do is in the in the Google Cloud console, I'm going to go to Cloud Run. And when we get to Cloud Run, we'll see our service here, the SKK Web UI. And I'm going to go click on that service. And now we can see some information metrics about the service. We can see our revisions. I've just got one revision that was deployed four minutes ago. I can come in here and double check my environment variables, which all looks correct. As far as I can tell, they're all set. And then I can also check the logs. And so the logs are going to be where we're going to see any potential er errors. And it looks like I maybe did get an error. And so we'll see if we can go see what my error was. And, oh, Victor, it's the same error that I was getting earlier this morning, but thought that I fixed it. 
by yeah um, so we might have uh, uh, we might have a solution for this one uh, I think we, we had this kind of like an unpleasant uh, race uh, where our uh, scheme registry was uh, created um, yeah, there's there some race condition, I think, where we, we created things too quickly or something. Yeah. So, for example... Oh, you know what, uh, it, you know what it maybe was? Was we created the case equal DB before we created the exactly. schema registry. Yeah. yeah. So, let's uh, let's go and uh, roll, roll this back in, um, uh, in our cluster. So, let's get... Uh, we can either create new case equal DB uh, instance. It will just take us, like, a few more seconds to set up. Minutes, okay. We can yeah. answer some questions, or just go do, uh, yeah, delete this one and create new application. Okay, this sometimes the provisioning for this takes a, a little bit, so hang with us, and we will we will get this all working. Yeah, it's it's all live, nothing is scripted, so like we are here with you and uh, exploring. If something was everything would be perfect, no one would believe this, right? So it That's people right. say, like, "Yeah, you just like it's Photoshop." But uh, <laughs> now you see it's uh, it is actual stuff in the real world and things happening. Um, this is how I'm providing emotion support for uh, for this application. So create, um, yep, create application. Okay. Uh, global access. And in the future, we we will remember to provision our schema registry before yeah. we create our case equal DB. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So it will take some time. We can take some questions uh, into um, into um, into. So there's the there's actually another thing we'll have to do once this is done provisioning is I think we're going to have to go and reset our keys for talking uh in lab three you know how we um create the yes. api keys that talk to exactly. that th they're assigned to a specific case equal db id and we're now going to have a new one so we're going to have to rerun the steps from lab three task one to get our new values and then we're going to have to redeploy with those new environment variables. So right. in typical cloud native style, whenever we make a, a change to the environment variables or to the settings for a application on cloud run, then that actually deploy, the way we do that is to deploy a new revision. The nice thing about that is that it can allow us to roll back changes to configuration easily. Um, but we will have to, after we get new values for these, have to go redeploy. And But I think now we have a schema registry we are recreating our case equal db we'll get those new values for our case really what we need is the case equal db uh endpoint username and password and then we'll go redeploy with those new values and i think we'll be golden and uh we do have some responses on um on uh, the, uh, 1979 so um apparently so the epoch zero started at december 1979 uh, and uh, in December 39, it was like 10 years since Epoch 10, uh, Zero. So <laughs> something interesting. Uh, also, some interesting information from Luciano. Winterland Law Raw Concert Hall in San Francisco closes after 556 concert. Thanks for this information. I didn't know um, <laughs> that, uh, you know, we are like that, <laughs> that deep into this one. Um, so um, so some some of the issues with this like service is not available. We will investigating this right now, and I feel that we face this uh, like a uh, race condition uh, with this. So exactly, yeah. So the Kisiko client trying to connect to the server and uh, could not uh, connect. So some people uh, who went through this. Um, um, Error 500, they actually went to log and discovered that the actual error is about that uh, KSQL client, uh, KSQL DB server would not be able to connect to uh, schema registry. So, yes, so, um, yes, we just removed the KSQL DB um, and looks like we created schema registry uh, after uh, we created the KSQL DB server. So, we should do this um, in a in a in order that KSQL DB goes uh, after uh, creating a schema registry, so that's, that's a, um, a, the first real bug in our workshop. I would I would say, Victor, and the reason why we um, 
hit this bug is because when we were testing this, we actually had created the the schema registry um, at a different. We had different ordering, and then and then we switched it, and um, and then every time we tested it, we actually were testing it like recreating the the case sql db after the schema registry was created exactly um so we we imposed a race condition on ourselves um and i guess did not do sufficient testing so um so uh, good to, to, good justin, to uh, have people qa for us right so like uh justin you are right it sounds the error sounds a little bit kind of like misleading but like let me explain this uh, in a few um in a few words. So essentially, the basically brains of this operation stores in the Kafka. Schemas stored in the Kafka, and KSQL DB uses uh, the Kafka to store some intermediate data. So schema registry, when it starts, uh, oh sorry, well, KSQL DB, when it starts, it introspects this environment. And if in my environment I already have a schema registry set up, I, I started this, it will inject this in. Um, into KSQL DB uh, settings. So there's a command available in KSQL DB. If you go in into um, KSQL DB.io, you can find this, how we can run CLI um, against the KSQL DB in the cloud. You will be able to perform a command called, uh, like show me the properties. And one of the properties you will see, you will learn, or even better, James, we can show this in, um, while it's starting, we can show this in your ID or even my ID. Let me show this real quick in, um, in my ID. So um, while we're loading this, we do have this uh, thing um, around test containers. And uh, if you found this, um, it's in, in the test directory on VS to Kafka. You can find there's a container for, for Kafka, Zookeeper, Schema Registry. And KSQL DB. Um, where is it? Uh, KSQL DB is a different project, right? So it's uh, somewhere here. Yeah. So the KSQL DB here. So when the KSQL DB uh, container starts, uh, this environment variable or like a KSQL DB uh, KSQL opts needs to be um, uh, needs to be provided. Sorry, I switched to uh, to my screen. So. Um, when I go to Web UI project inside the test Kotlin SKK folder, you find this test Kafka config factory, and this factory uh, will shows like what you know you would do in a like we have serverless and servers in the, in the server based environment. Um, so schema registry starts before uh, KSQL DB because schema registry URL needs to be injected into KSQL DB option. So that's why we had this race where our KSQL DB server was created before we initialized the schema registry uh, URL for um, for this um, for this application. I hope this helps. Um, yeah, of course. That's uh, you. You should know like how the things works. At least in this stage of our like serverless journey, still requires some of the engineering, um, uh, the, the the knowledge around the, how the things work. So, uh, James, how is it uh, on your side of things? Mine is still provisioning, but we haven't actually walked through the web UI code yet, and so yeah, let's maybe do we this can. One. Um, do a walkthrough and then hopefully our KSQL DB will be provisioned and we'll be um, good to go. Okay, so my web UI that we're gonna get up and running here in a little bit, uh, it's a Spring Boot application and it has, um, it takes a reactor client. So we talked about that reactor client a little bit ago when we were talking about how we set up the stream and the table. And so we need that reactor client the way that we actually set up that reactor client is down here in our Kafka config factory. What we do what is we, we do say, is we all, say right. all right. <clears throat> oh, and oh, Victor, and I got some echo. echo. OK, so okay, we have, so a, we bean, have a bean. And it's, and it's conditional, conditional on a property, property being, being uh, exposed, yeah, exposed, which is KSQL, KSQL DB endpoint, endpoint KSQL, KSQL DB username, username and password. And password. And, and if, if you remember, remember from when, from we, when did we did the deploy, deploy oh, oh, Victor is still, still echoing. echoing. So when, so we, when did we did the deploy, deploy of this, of this we, set we set environment, environment variables, variables for, those for those three things. things. So, Spring so Spring Boot will read those, those environment, environment variables. variables. And, and if they're, if they're set, set, then this then is this how is we're going to set up the connection to the KSQL DB 
service. So we use those environment variables. We set the host and port. We set the username and password, and we return that beam. So that's how we provide the configuration for production. Um, there's different a different way to provide that configuration when we are uh, running against test containers. And I think Victor showed you a little bit of that. OK, so our web application needs that reactor client so we can talk to ksql db. Our index page, what it does is it just returns a plain HTML web page, which I'll show you in a minute. Our slash total page is using Kotlin coroutines, which is one of the nice things about Spring Boot, is being able to use Kotlin coroutines for our async non-blocking stuff. And we use the reactor client. We execute a query, select star from totals. We're getting the total number of favorites out of that table that's created in ksql db. And then we just need to map that data, uh, and I return a default of, of 0. Uh, assuming that query executes successfully. OK, and then we have a mapping for slash name. Uh, so if you go to our web app slash like Java, what that's going to do is render the most recent questions for that are tagged Java. OK, then let's go take a look at our UI. So um, because I like. Um, <laughs> I like doing lots of stuff in Kotlin. I actually created the HTML page in Kotlin. And so this is um, an alternative to just writing HTML um, because I'm weird. And, uh, and so I wrote the web page in Kotlin. And there's a nice little Kotlin library to make this easy. But I, I create this web page that we're going to be seeing in a little bit. Um, I think I'm using Bootstrap via web jars for the actual CSS there. Um, and then there's a few more UI elements. So that's that's the the web page. But then I also have in my web application, I have my JavaScript file. And my JavaScript file, what it does is it makes a, a fetch get request to slash total. That was the endpoint that we saw back in the main application, this get handler for slash total. Um, so this is this is just returning uh, like an AJAX request, whatever. Uh, it's not going to return a full web page, just that data. OK, so I'm making that git request, update the DOM. And then I also open a WebSocket. And that WebSocket is to slash langs. And on slash langs, I'm going to read the WebSocket and update the web page whenever that happens. And we wanted to show you two different ways to do these queries uh, against. We wanted to show you like a query that um, that is just a, a one-time query and then a query that is a yeah. stream. There is a two types of queries that are available in uh, KSQL DB. One is uh, pull query, another one is push query. So pull query that looks like a traditional database query when you have something like select something from table where equals something. Uh, in this case, you will get immediate result, and there's that's it. The, your 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 query is done. And there's a push query where you open and you get the constant stream of results. And in this uh, example, we do use uh, both uh, versions of this. So there is a stream query um, that uh, reactor client can do this. And uh, as a new message will arrive, we will do something. In this case, we will simply push it to um, to UI. So we can display this. And if you, you can total, show the total, um, this is our going to be our um, uh, our pull query uh, when we use yeah, so this to total thing. So this WebSocket is going to be streaming. The, the Remember, that's the count. That's based on a table that is maintaining a count of the number of questions with a particular tag. And so what we output in here is the language and then the number. And so um, this is going to be constantly refreshing based on that table as that table, uh, that stateful table is changing. And that emit changes here in the query is what allows us to do the stream query uh, to, to get a flux, uh, which is the stream of, um, of results. And then we just send that out to the WebSocket. Yep. Um, so there was a question about like uh, uh, if we have to change endpoint uh, because of uh, uh, DB was recreated. Yes, that's what we're going to be doing. James, uh, go ahead and let's check if yeah, KSQLDB let's, was Yeah, let's go check back there and see uh, just, if uh, our refresh the screen. KSQLDB is. Yeah. yeah, let's see if it's loaded. Still, Mine is still, uh, still provisioning. provisioning. Yep. Yeah. So it takes some takes some time. Um, so, but um, I believe you still be able to um, mm, 
you should be able to start uh, configuring things because like oh, if true. you run this uh, yes. KSQL you... DB uh, list of apps, you should be able to see this um, uh, application. At least this, you know, this application will be provisioning things, but uh, yeah. it may be not yeah, fully available. So, so we're gonna set our, reset our environment variables so that we can get our KSQL DB endpoint username and password because we need those. So let's um, let's rerun this and see if that's gonna work. So I think that all looks good. Um, we can so that's in lab three, task one, and then we can validate that those were set with uh, task zero on lab four. And looks like those are those are all set. So, um, so I think you're right, Victor. I think uh, that we can run that step while it's provisioning, and then we can also redeploy our new version with those new environment variables uh, while it's provisioning as well. And then once it's provisioned, then um, then we'll try it out and, and see if it works. So this is just rerunning the same G Cloud run deploy, and now it's going to have those updated uh, KSQL DB environment variables. But let's run that and redeploy and then I'll check back and hope we get our um, KSQL DB app provisioned here quickly and um, and can then give it a try maybe and we should it, have uh, maybe we should have gone for eight uh, uh, streaming units and maybe in this case it would be uh, faster <laughs> but um, I don't know like it's uh, it takes some time it's a uh, it does a lots of uh, um, lots of checks I guess during the startup you know, so Thank goodness I don't need to actually like uh, fill out a form to order some servers and then wait months That's for true. those servers to be ordered and delivered and then wait more months for those servers to be provisioned. Um, you know, I've been through that before and, uh, and, and this does seem like some of these things can take a little while to provision, but hey, it's a whole lot better than how it used to be. Yeah, exactly. So, and uh, resources on demand, uh, you can increase the number of resources. Um, it should it should give you also like maybe something like a 500 or something like that, right? Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what air we get if yeah. <laughs> while we're provisioning. So I can the URL for my app is in this Cloud Run UI. So yeah. if I open that up, then um, that should trigger. Let's see the app to load and. Then, um, yep, there we go. Okay, um, <laughs> failed to resolve host name. Yeah, it's always Maybe. DNS. DNS is always the thing that takes the longest to provision. So that's probably yeah. what we're waiting on is like DNS provisioning or something. So if it can't yeah. resolve that that host name, then it's just waiting for uh, um, some some DNS to uh, to resolve or something. So it's interesting. So um, there's, let's see some, uh, let's see some questions. Um, so yes, when you run this uh, cloud command, um, you can see if the application, what kind of state of application. So you do cloud, um, uh, cloud, uh, uh, KSQL apps list. You will, sh you should see. Um, Is it KSQL apps list yeah. like that? Yeah. Oh, app. Yeah, not single similar app. And you can get the, uh, um, yep. So it says provisioning, you see? Still, uh, still provisioning. Uh, the the DNS, uh, DNS name is there, but it's still, still be provisioning. All right, so let's see if we have any other- It looked like uh, it was questions. some internal, internal DNS that was, uh, yeah, yeah, that was yeah. an internal Google Cloud one. Um, some uh, maybe we do have some other questions. Let's see. Um, so um, I'm just looking to uh, to chat, um, uh, folks. Write down if it's like uh, useful at all for for anyone. Like uh, how many of you actually using Kotlin, uh, for example, these days? Uh, write down in the comments. And also, I want to say huge, huge, huge respect for those of you who stick around. Uh, we are strong and we're closing the. Um, third hour uh, we will have a we're basically on the finish line right now uh, and uh, thank you so much for those uh, people who stick around almost like all the time um, and uh, we hope um, you learn something uh, new and exciting today so the um, uh, we can 
we can just like await or we can talk about some some interesting bits of the technology james so this thing with the html that you show uh, <laughs> like, uh, like why and uh, how and uh, let's talk about this so yeah the, the, about this like a pattern that allows you to um to do this kind of stuff like if you open this your code um let's let's talk about this a little bit yeah. about kotlin so yeah. we, we do ties as a okay. kotlin workshop let's talk about kotlin so let's talk about kotlin. look at this look at this it looks like you actually programming html but without the uh, braces right yeah, I mean, this is this is a Kotlin DSL for creating HTML. And so because Kotlin has some nice support for building DSLs um, that make things look declarative, this looks a lot like the HTML that we would normally write looks. But it's all typed. And so you'll see that um, there's actually one example in here where I had to add a new content type in because I'm using this HTML tag called a template. And Kotlin HTML didn't have a template tag. And so I had to create some extension functions uh, to allow us to on flow content, which is one of the DOM kind of parts here, to have a ability to do a template tag. And we'll actually see this get used down in here. So I've got, um, this is like the body of the page. Uh, and I put into the body of the page a template um, in a div, but this template tag didn't exist. So I had to create that, but it's all type safe. You know, like I can't just come in here and say like whatever, um, because that that's like not a valid thing to put in a template. You'll see the IntelliJ is telling me like, hey, you can't put an ASDF inside of a template. That's not valid. Um, and so it's nice to have this actual like type DSL to write my HTML. Uh, you will remember that I did write JavaScript for this one. Yes. Which just pained me a little bit because in a lot of my recent projects, I've actually written the JavaScript in Kotlin as well. And so there's That's another way. You compile Kotlin to JavaScript. That's right. Yeah. 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 And so in in a bunch of my recent applications, everything is Kotlin in them. The the back end is Kotlin, the HTML is Kotlin, the JavaScript is Kotlin. Um, you know, I just use Kotlin everywhere I possibly <laughs> can, which which is a, a little extreme, but I sure like having the type system there to give me compile errors uh, that that things are incorrect and that sort of thing. So, so um, let's take a look. So uh, Sharon says that uh, accidentally run the command to recreate schema registry. So uh, actually the command when you're creating schema registry is that important. So once you create a scheme registry uh, it will not create the new one so scheme registry is available per environment so you should be fine you will get the output of existing scheme registry so uh corner says it's the first time learning kotlin so yeah that's um uh, that's interesting. How you feel about this? Uh, like my first impression of the kotlin I even I'm java developer like when I first time saw it I can read this. I cannot say yeah, I mean the same about Scala. Even even Scala developers <laughs> cannot read other Scala developers code. Um, I I do like Kotlin a lot. I I went from Java to Scala and now to Kotlin, and and I do really like Scala because now I know it. Um, but Kotlin was a whole lot more approachable for me as a Java developer. Uh, it has great interop with Java, and it has some things in it that that I really miss when I go back to writing Java. So one of those things is type inference. So you'll see that in, in none of my code, I really, except for like in, in uh, method signatures, I don't really specify types of things. If we go look at like my main application here, um, you'll see like, you know, my question, it doesn't have a type specified. It just gets inferred. Um, and so the, the type inference part of it is something that I, I really like about Kotlin. Um, and I think Java is getting some of that uh, at, at some point. But um, uh, and then another thing that I really like is that I really like to program with immutable data structures. So vowels um, instead of uh, instead of vars and, and keep everything as immutable as possible. And for me, Kotlin makes that quite a bit easier. Um, and then one of the, the really important things about Kotlin is uh, is built in language support for nullability. So you'll see that um, that on this this 
function, I have a var arg args string question mark. What that question mark means is that this is potentially nullable. Um, so args could be null. And so then I get compile time safety around dealing with nullability. So if I try to reference something that is nullable, but I don't do it in a null safe way, then the compiler is actually going to prevent me from doing that. So it just makes yeah. the explicit null handling uh, something enforced by the compiler, which has saved me from a whole lot of null pointer exceptions. So, um, so we do have a, another question about uh, resources of uh, learning Kotlin, like... Um, yes. Uh, so um, our friend uh, Bruce Eckel just wrote a book called Atomics. Uh, Atomic. He wrote Atomic Kotlin, but now he is also just uh, finished Atomic Kotlin. And so yeah. that is a great uh, beginner book. Um, for those that are that are learning uh, Kotlin, so I would. Uh, and the Sharon is right. Friend, I would Kotlin, take there, but. Kotlin does look like a lot of fun. Uh, no pun intended. So there was a question from uh, um, Jorge about uh, automating things, um, and uh, we just posted this link. Uh, you can find this thing called the Cloud Stack. Yes, you can automate all the steps that we did with uh, C Cloud, uh, but we decide we wanted to this be explicit, so you would know what is going on there. So meanwhile, I'm answering the question. James can check if the, his uh, KCL db now finally up um and uh, uh jorge looks like a very much my from my people yes kotlin looks very much like groovy and there's a lot of inspiration in groovy um so gradle still written the, no gradle yes james we do have uh i'm still i'm still provisioning but I, I, I did want to point out another yeah i did it's did you? provisioning um what about the uh, uh, run the in the in the UI? Maybe, oh, sorry, on CLI. Maybe CLI will show this. Do we need to restart mm -hmm. when, uh, or the application will be automatically restarted every time? Yeah, it should just be restarted. Yep, it's starting. Um. One of the other great things about Kotlin is the coroutines. So coroutines are a really nice way to do um, reactive and async stuff. There's nice language support for, for doing that. Um, that was the suspend function. Spring Boot it has great support for having non-blocking HTTP endpoints that are uh, suspend functions. So, um, so the, I really like the coroutine support for um, uh, doing concurrent um, reactive type of stuff. Oh, this Looks is like a great question, actually. So, uh, seals been waiting. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great question. So, um, the AWS serverless guru suggests not to use Java during the JVM um, startup time. What about GCP? Also, Kotlin is JVM based, I think, and the same startup problem. And I know that James knows the exact answer because <laughs> he also tinkering with some advanced tech that we didn't cover today. But hey, let's do it. So. Uh, it's a great question. This is called a cold start. What happens is is that when you when you scale when you have to scale up, the reason why you're scaling up is because there's a request coming in and you don't have the resources behind it to actually handle that request yet. And so this can happen when you're going from zero to one or one to two or 100 to 101. Whenever your demand is exceeding your supply of instances, you get a cold start. And the cold start takes as long as it takes for your application to start up and be able to handle HTTP requests. And so in a, in a dynamic scaling environment, like uh, serverless, most serverless platforms, you need to think about what, how to handle this, this problem, especially if there are users that are potentially going to be just sitting there waiting. So if you've got a user that has just clicked checkout and nothing seems to happen for a while because they've hit the server that is you know, currently spinning up to handle their request, like that's a bad thing. And so there are some ways to deal with this. One way to deal with the cold starts is to try to reduce your startup time. So there are uh, some techniques to do this um, on the JVM, and especially with things that do auto wiring at runtime at startup, these startup times can take a while for the JVM to start, for Spring Boot to find all the beans and wire them all together. And so one of the ways that you can do this is to, uh, is to do um, more compile time wiring of your application. And this is what Micronaut 
does. And I think that Spring Boot is now working on a way, or maybe has a way to do compile time wiring. And so that can be one way to reduce your startup time, but you still have the JVM startup time. And so uh, there's a newer technology called Graal VM, which allows you to ahead of time compile a JVM based application so that it no longer runs on the JVM, it runs as a native binary. And so Graal VM is something that is um, pretty new. And there are some challenges because when you do ahead of time compilation, you can't do all the dynamic stuff that a lot of our Java libraries do um, by default. And so, uh, for instance, when you do reflection, that is a dynamic operation that cannot be ahead of time compiled. And so yeah. what you need to do is you need to have a way to tell Graal VM about your reflection points so that it can then handle those dynamic things uh, in the right way when they happen. So, so how does there it, are ways um, to do it, but how, how does it there's do some it? challenges. Like, is, it, uh, is it something that uh, replaces with like some explicit calls or creates some of the uh, blocks of code that is... Uh, you know the important for 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 this code like because usually you do reflection because you don't know uh something about i don't know like maybe some type of information maybe not available for you and you want to learn this dynamically or things like that right yeah so reflection has been a a important way of how we have done a lot of stuff in the java ecosystem whether it's spring doing wiring and discovery of beans whether it's doing injection whether we're doing serialization there's a lot of dynamic things that happen at runtime typically in jvm applications um, you can with graal vm native image specify those things and graal vm when it creates the native image will know how to deal with them i don't know the magic underneath the covers of how it yeah. actually does that with the ahead of time compilation um there maybe we should using... uh we should re rewrite the uh the key sql db with graal vm so the startup time will be faster uh, <laughs> how is uh is it is, are we still we still provisioning let's see let's see here still provisioning oh man Come we on, i got man. i got like at the back of the line or something here yeah like I should, uh, should should call the support. Um, That's right. Hopefully do, somebody's um, pager pager is yeah. going off right now. Um, okay, so do, uh, so can you do CLI uh, and see if uh, if it's available in CLI? Still provisioning. provisioning. All right. <laughs> so I think uh, I think uh, this is something that we will take as an extra extra curriculum activity. Well, I think it's homework for everyone is that once yes. their case equal DB uh, provisions, then then they can send us a screenshot on uh, Twitter or on the comments here uh, to show us this all actually working. And so apologize that we someone, created a race condition. Yeah, someone asked this question actually, like would be uh, um, somewhere can support the hands on. Yes, um, you can go and join our um, Slack. Uh, which is uh, cnfil.io slash slack um, where um, I will probably need to create a some sort of group uh, for this uh, for the live streams uh, but like you can ping me there like I'm in the slack you can uh, send me some of the questions if you have if you want to do this uh, by yourself um, but uh, the hardest part actually was done right so we already we, we handled hardest part like we showed you how we can set up um, how you see set up billing, most important. Um, the, uh, we will give like a few more seconds uh, to James to check if the key sequel DB up and running because we I have, need And to I have show one more you. thing to say about yeah. cold starts because if I don't yes. say it, I'm, I'm going to um, regret it. On Cloud Run, you can specify the minimum number of instances to keep warm. And so that's another way to deal with cold starts is just over provision. And in that case, like, is it serverless? Because then you're not really fully based, uh, your, your billing isn't based on your demand. You are just over provisioning uh, to deal with, with that like we've traditionally done. Um, so I, I don't know if it totally fits the model of what serverless is all about, but on Cloud Run, you can set the minimum number of instances to avoid cold starts too. Um, we're doing a last call and seeing if the thing is, uh, is still provisioning. You know what's going to be a funny thing? We just like we will just end the stream, and all of a sudden it will become. Uh, of course, available. it's going to work. Yeah, as soon yeah, as yeah. as soon as we end it. But. So, um, uh, folks, you got the uh, you got the pretty good idea what uh, we're doing here. Um, someone uh, from my team will post the um, 
Slack link uh, very soon. Or maybe uh, maybe I will move this to forum. We just started a pretty cool uh, forum uh, where uh, we can uh, try to answer all these kind of questions. Um, so most importantly, uh, if you uh, follow what our instructions, when you're done with this, uh, please, 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 let me show you on my screen. So please, 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 um, you know what? Uh, why I didn't run this? Uh, because let me let me actually try to run this uh, myself. Um, <laughs> so I do have something that's already uh, prepared for uh, for this. So I would have my Gradle. Um, let's do this one. Gradle. I will still will be able to show this via Stukafka. Um, let me see export. Like a SQL DB endpoints and all this kind of stuff. Uh, let's see, K SQL DB. I should be able to to have it somewhere. Hopefully, let me see. Uh, Do you have a working one? You know, Victor. If I don't know why I didn't think of this before, but we have all this working with test containers. You know, where we could have just run, we could have just run this all right, against test containers right. to show people that work in. Yeah. I think we just uh, we just got tired with the um, with this thing. So let's do this one. Let's do it as containers, um, um, and uh, we will show this working on the local uh, local environment. So I'll switch to your screen. It's then. it's going to be a little bit tricky though because you um, you need to be able to to send the messages like produce the messages into your test container based Kafka cluster. Um, uh -huh. So it's it's not super straightforward yet. Right. We need to the, we, need we need to, to work uh, on the yeah easier. we need to work on this one. So let, let's call run the command. If it's not uh, provisioned, if finished provisioned, um, we will done. Provisioned. Okay, so that that's that's would be uh, all for today. Sorry, uh, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that, that's how it happens. Anyway, so that's right. um, so what what did we learn today? It's still hard, you know. Serverless is still hard. Uh, but we're trying. We're trying to do our best uh, with all these uh, sort of things. So um, these and it's uh, all portable. Uh, Everything we did today, you can run on the cloud. The managed services like we've been using, you can run on your own Kubernetes. You can run in test containers. Uh, everything that we've built and showed is is portable, and that's um, definitely one of the the key things that we wanted to highlight is that serverless is great, but make sure that your serverless is portable. And with so, ours, it is, and we should have planned for the bailout to bail to our yeah. uh, our our um, test container based setup. So um, for um, as a as a thank you, uh, as I promised, for those of you who stick around for a little while, I just posted a code for three hundred bucks that you can use in Confluent Cloud that will allows you to play around with this a little bit more. Um, you still will be able to apply this code in your account. You go into billing and there's a place where you can apply this promo code. Um, you can uh, play around and make sure like maybe in a more um, like relaxed setting after that you will you know grab a coffee, uh, read through the instructions, run this and let us know. Like um, did you, you see these Twitter things? Um, let us know in Twitter uh, how did it go. You can always ask these questions. Um, you can always ask these questions in Slack. You can always reach out to, to us directly. I super, super excited that uh, James joined me today. Uh, write down the comments if you want to see James more in this channel and uh, we'll try to make this, uh, this happen. And also folks, I would say that was a uh, first season finale of the live streams. Um, 22 episodes, like all good old days, like all the shows that uh, not running on Netflix, they have a run for 24, 22 episodes. I should I should done 24 because you know someone does get the reference from uh, from my intro. But uh, yeah, I'll take some break, uh, reconvene, and uh, the, the only way how you can uh, if you like the show, just continue to support, write comments, and uh, let us know. Um, and uh, James, any uh, final uh, final words? Oh, it's been super fun. I appreciate you uh, helping me get all this built. And um, and yeah, this was super fun. I learned a lot from this as well. So hopefully others did too. And yeah, uh, ping us if there's anything we can help you with. Um, would love to help with anything Google Cloud or Kafka or Kotlin or 
test containers. Um, just let us know. Yeah, so the promo code is in the chat. This is promo code for Confluent Cloud. Let me uh, display this on the screen. So this promo code, Cloud300. I wanted to have a Cloud3000 to reference to um, Infinity War <laughs> in the end game. We love you, 3000. But hey, uh, Cloud300, uh, thank you for being a part of live streams. Um, and um, my name is Victor Gamov, and uh, as always, have a nice day. Uh, and uh, this was James Ward from Google Cloud. And uh, thank you Thanks, so much. Thanks, Victor. For, for